So this is a it's quite an old, quite famous um, photograph actually of a dissected nervous system, the entire dissected, and it was the first time anyone had done this. It was about 1888. Um, and I brought this up because the other reason I like functional neurological disorders is that they um, they bring you back to other really big questions um, about what's going on with the mind and the body and where, where are symptoms coming from. Um, because ever since Descartes said that the mind was sort of separate from the body, we've been a bit stuck with that. It's quite pervasive. It's both in our lay understanding of where our symptoms come from um, and in, in medicine sort of professionally. Um, people, you know, the orthopaedic surgeons will say, oh, we can't find a cause of this, it must be psychological. And, um, and it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, and I think when you're working with functional neurological disorders clinically, it's a bit like you're glimpsing the matrix all the time. You're seeing why that, why that couldn't possibly be true. So what is functional neurological symptom disorder? Um, so this is the DSM-5 criteria. Um, these criteria, they're, they're written by people I'm on the basis of clinical syndromes. They, they change over time. Um, this, is, this is the current ones that we, that we mainly use. It's a bit different in ICD-11. And we just have to remember the sort of limitations of these classification systems. Um, but essentially, uh, there is, uh, one or more symptoms of altered voluntary motor or sensory function. So that might be weakness, might be sensory loss, um, it might be um, seizures or seizure-like episodes um, or abnormal movements, might be a visual problem, anything really um, that can be produced by the neurological symptom um, system. Um, and although it is produced by the voluntary motor system or the sensory system, um, it is experienced as involuntary. So, so these are not voluntary symptoms when we're talking about functional neurological disorder um, essentially, it's not voluntary. Um, there is clinical evidence of incompatibility between the symptoms and recognised uh, sort of pathophysiological disease. So it just doesn't fit with pathophysiological disease. But more importantly, and I think it's not properly really encoded into this, um, these criteria, the symptoms are internally inconsistent. So um, we can demonstrate that sometimes the system is able to function normally and other times it is not. And that's very much part of how we make the diagnosis. Um, and C, it says the symptom is or deficit is not better explained by another medical or mental disorder, but that doesn't mean that another medical or mental disorder can't also be present. Um, and, in, and quite often in people that I see for medical legal um, reports, there will be uh, there will be a mixture. So somebody will have some uh, structural deficit or injury, but there will be some functional overlay and a degree of reversibility that that's also present, um, and it causes significant impairment. Um, so, so this is a video of, uh, so I'm going to take you through some of the um, clinical signs that we use to make a diagnosis of um, FND, functional neurological disorder. Um, and I'm going to do that partly because you'll read about these in reports and I think it's helpful for you to have actually seen what they, what they look like. Um, and also because they sort of, they help you to understand a bit of the, the the sort of mechanism of symptoms. So they can't always tell you why the person is getting those, those symptoms, but they can say a bit about what's going on, what's going wrong. So um, this is a, quite an old video of Professor uh, John Stone um, demonstrating um, Hoover's sign. So I'm gonna tell you what happens and then you can watch and, um, and see what's happening. So um, uh, this lady has got a weak right leg. She's got a functional neurological disorder causing a weakness on her right side. Um, so what you notice is that when he asks her to press down with that right leg, um, it's weak. You can lift it up. She's got no power there. Um, but then he asks her to focus on the on the good leg, on the left leg, and to push up. Um, uh, and when she's distracted by that, and when she's focusing on that movement, the automatic downward movement of the other other leg returns. So it's, it's sort of complicated to explain, but but if you if you watch what's happening here. Yes, so um it's i think it's nice because it's it's very specific to um fnd you don't, don't get that in stroke or other things um that's a really nice example um it also demonstrates some of the some of what's going on, some of the sort of pathology. So um, when this person's attention is focused on the good leg, that symptom disappears. So there's something about attention and where your where your focus is that's that's driving the symptoms. Now this 
patient has a functional tremor. Um, and what the examiner asks them to do is to, to tap a rhythm uh, as, as accurately as possible. And the first thing you see is it's very difficult because it's got this tremor going on, which actually his brain is really quite involved in. Um, it's not voluntary, but it, it's using the same parts of the brain. Um, and when he taps the rhythm, the tremor is either suppre suppressed or it entrained. So what we see is people will be like this and they tap and then it, it goes into the same rhythm because your brain just can't, can't do that two different things at the same time. So again, the use of sorry, the use of distraction, um, distracting someone's attention. It's really got so much attention to to sort of um, su suppress the to, to suppress the symptom, and that's that's again a really specific sign. Um, the other things that we see are sort of patterns of symptoms that just they're just inconsistent with um, with sort of other sorts of disease. So um, so this lady has got a leg weakness. She's got a functional gait disorder, so walking disorder. Um, and whereas somebody who's had a stroke um, uh, or has a lower motor neuron weakness in the leg, they will tend to sort of hitch the hip up and swing it round uh, because that's the most ergonomic way. It's the most energy saving way to, to walk if you've got a weak leg. And you see this characteristic pattern in some, not all people with functional neurological disorder, where they sort of drag the leg behind to the extent that they get a sore foot. It's very, uh, it's very effortful. It's very. Uh, John And just come back. Right. And again, that's really specific to functional neurological disorder. You just don't see that in other things. And the other interesting thing is it's been really stable historically. So we've got these great videos of shell shocked um, soldiers um, with, the, with the same the same gait, with their pictures from uh, you know, very early photographs and drawings from um, from even earlier sort of, uh, you know, the very earliest photos of people doing the same thing. So this is the soldiers at Seal Hay Hospital. It's speeded up. But you can kind of see he's dragging that foot and then it's magically cured and he does this nice little step. Of it. <laughs> There's a little step at the end that makes it, I think. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so we've got this nice video footage, especially from the shell shock sol soldiers, many of whom had functional neurological symptoms. Now, this is uh, another demonstration of um, another demonstration of uh, the effect of uh, modulating someone's attention um, to kind of provide some relief from the symptoms. So this is, uh, I think this is a really nice video because the patient describes what he's experiencing and the feel of having these symptoms. So it's, it's not, um, it's, it's not voluntary, but there's a lot of effort involved in his walking. And he says it feels effortful. It's like he's having to try for something that is normally automatic. Um, and when uh, the examiner, and I think it's John Stone again, um, who's, you know, really uh, been really good at sort of uh, describing these, um, these clinical signs. Uh, what you see is that he, he does some unusual things uh, and it makes it much easier. So, so sort of just. Yeah. I'll see you later. 
so I'm not sure how generalizable that was for him um, in terms of treatment, but that's the sort of things that we do in treatment for FND. Um, it's not you're, you're not trying to really exercise people to really focus on things. You're trying to get them to do things a bit differently to sort of subvert these um, abnormal movement patterns. Um, and I think that's what makes it exciting. So the other thing that we see is um, patterns of sensory loss that are they're just not consistent with anatomy. So um, we, we might see people who have a very sharp line. So we'll say I'm numb on this side, but a very sharp line down the middle. And you just don't you just don't really get that. There's no anatomical basis for that. The dermatomes, they sort of they're a bit more patchy and they, um, you know, there, there tends to be a sort of overlap in the middle. People who have, you know, a completely numb arm with a sort of very circumferential um, line at the top. Um, so it feels normal here, not here, not here. Actually, that's not how your dermatomes work. So the uh, the nerve roots, they're they're in much more odd slices. So so that can be helpful when people report sensory loss. Of course, sensory loss is difficult because there's no way of objectifying it. We, if somebody says they are numb, we assume that they are numb, but you, there's no actually no way of testing that um, objectively. This is another one. So. Um, and a bit more of an unusual symptom, but when, with functional visual loss, which we, we do sometimes see, um, somebody might say that they have a, a very small visual field, but it won't behave according to the rules of optics. So if you have a constricted visual field, it's still bigger further away because just that's how light goes through your pupil and hits the back of your eye. Whereas uh, in a, a functional disorder, it will be much more of a sort of tubular and it just doesn't obey the, the rules of optics. And that's probably partly telling us that these symptoms are based um, partly on our ideas, on our perceptions and beliefs about what symptoms look like. Uh, and I was going to, I was trying to find videos of functional seizures. They're actually pretty unpleasant to watch, so I decided not to. And this is a, fa a famous um, picture of Charcot at the Salpetrie. Um, I'm not sure if you can see here on the back wall, there's a um, painting of somebody having a functional seizure who's in this sort of Arc de Siecle position sort of rolled right over backwards. Um, and this is one of the, the patients. They were sort of celebrity patients. It was a pretty strange setup. Um, I have sort of swooning into a, a functional seizure, uh, watched on by lots of male uh, doctors. Um, and functional seizures have their own semiology. So they, uh, they sort of, there are lots of features, too many to go through, I, I think here, and, and to do it justice. Um, lots of ways that we can discriminate a functional seizure from an epileptic seizure, but that can sometimes be difficult if, if nobody can describe one. So you, you want a good description or a video. Um, sometimes if things are unclear enough, we need um, a video EEG. So where you've got a recording of the electrical activity in the brain alongside a video of the seizure, and that, that's the kind of gold standard. But, but functional seizures they tend to be much longer than epileptic seizures. Um, so that, and that means that most people who have seen somebody having a seizure, um, actually probably most people who've seen a seizure, it's been a non-epileptic seizure just because of the probability, the, the duration of those seizures. Um, they, patients often have their eyes closed. Um, the, the sorts of movements that people do during a non-epileptic or dissociative seizure are a bit different than the, the movements that people do during, um, during epilepsy. And there's a very different sort of post-ictal period, so the post-seizure period. Um, people are sometimes tearful and upset, but they're not usually groggy and disorientated in the same way they are after an epileptic seizure. And there's, there's a whole a whole range of, of things. But the, the other thing that's helpful in making a diagnosis, and, and I think especially in getting to the bottom of the why the first one might have happened, is um, getting people to describe you know, what happens at the first onset of the seizure. And people will all often describe either dissociation, so a horrible feeling of being separate from yourself or outside of your body or separate from everything around you, or um, sort of symptoms of a simple faint, so sort of feeling sweaty and just horrible, um, and then fainting. And then that, that's, you know, that's the trigger for um, later have de developing dissociative seizures. And some people um, describe symptoms of panic, which they don't recognise as being related to anxiety. So they'll say, I had um, 
you know, my heart was racing, um, my mouth was dry, my hands were sweating, I but I didn't feel anxious. You get the sort of panic without panic. Um, so it's really helpful to go to get them to describe the first episode because that can give you clues about what's been going on. And uh, I showed you these um, different examples of kind of clinical signs, clinical um, presentations of FND, um, partly because I do think they give you a few clues about what's going on in terms of why these symptoms are, are arising. Um, and I, I think essentially with it, the current sort of understanding is that there are probably several things going on, but the, the main theory is that actually our brain is a sort of predicting machine. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with Bayes' theorem that we're taking in information and we're updating our predictions about our experience of the world. Um, and we, we think that probably FND comes from uh, error in that system. So we're making prediction errors. It's also, the nervous system is also capable of learning um, and FND can result from aberrant learning, learning your brain's learning to do the wrong thing. Um, and the other thing that we know is that the brain and the nervous system, they're very plastic. So they do change over time a lot more than we used to think. Um, and sometimes that's a good thing if you've had a brain injury and you're needing to get around, get around that and make a recovery. But sometimes in FND, that's really a bad thing and your brain gets stuck doing things that you really don't want it to be doing. Um, so this is the, the kind of model of the brain as a predicting machine. So we've got um, ideas about what's going on in the world. We make predictions and some of them are in our conscious awareness. So we're able to say, this is what I think about. This is what I think a seizure looks like. This is what um, I think is going to happen with my illness. And some of them are below conscious understanding, um, but, but still very much part of our, our experience. And then we experience things from the world. So perhaps we break our arm and it feels a bit funny or we have a cast on our arm. It gets comes off and the, the arm feels a bit weird. Um, and these are all the times kind of updating each other and being, being processed. I'm just going to demonstrate how this. So uh, this is a satellite picture um, from Siberia. Um, and if you look through the sort of proper space satellite, if you look at the top, you get this really weird sort of um, flat topped um, plateau going. It's a bit like, bit like veins. But when we look at the picture upside down, um, it's much more obvious that that's a riverbed. Um, and that, that's because your brain is used to light coming from a certain angle and you interpret the picture in a certain way. It's not something you're thinking about, but you interpret this picture in a certain way. But whenever I put it back, it still looks like a flat top, even though I've told you that it's a riverbed. Um, maybe, I don't know what's anyway, but um, so, so all the time our brain is making these kind of predictions um, and uh, using that information and we're not aware of it. And I think that's important with FND. That this is not something that's usually under voluntary control. And another example of what I think this might feel like if you have FND is, you, you know, if you go, um, if you imagine you're about to step onto this uh, escalator uh, and actually it's broken, you do sort of sort of lurch because you're expecting it to be moving. Your brain tells you that escalators are usually moving. Um, uh, but it's not. And that's that. I think that must be a bit like what the experience of FND is like. Your predictions are have gone a bit wrong. Um, I've say, looked at videos of broken elevator escalator for this um, and they were horrific, <laughs> even for personal injury lawyers. So <laughs> just use the picture. Um, and then just to talk a bit about plasticity and whether a small aside to complex regional pain syndrome, which has really big overlaps with functional neurological disorder. Um, I think we see that more than the pain specialists <laughs> acknowledge. Um, but the, these are the two videos here, I can show them. So on the left, this is a foot of somebody with CRPS, which is a, uh, a pain syndrome which develops after a, a physical injury. Oh. oh, it's not making sure the one. Well, on the one on the left, it's kind of just a bit shaky. The one on the right. We, you can see the spangles. Yes. You just close your eyes and just tell me what that left foot feels like with your eyes. It feels like it's scared. It feels completely straight. And when you look in your eyes and you look at it again. Yeah, I can see it straight. Yeah. Oh. So is that, how, what was that, is that a strange feeling, that difference between? Yes, it feels, it feels strange. It feels all those things bad. And I know it's bad. And my eyes are shut. It's scared. 
So really strange things going on. So the uh, again, this person's predictions about what's going on with their foot, they're not being updated correctly based on what they can see. There's some overwhelming information coming from somewhere that the foot is straight and it's not straight and then that's keeping it bent. And um, these feet um, get into horrible deformed positions. And then, of course, you get secondary contractures in the, the muscles and the tendons. And, that, and once you get to that stage, it's very difficult to, to fix. And of course, it, it can stop people mobilizing, especially if both feet are affected. And I think what's interesting is we've done, um, if you look at functional imaging uh, and also actually structural imaging of the brains of people with these conditions, you can see um, uh, changes in the uh, the connectivity and also the size of the areas represented by the injured, the, the injured part of the body. Um, and that probably is reversible uh, up to a point. Once your foot is stuck, it's not reversible because it's mechanically stuck. But um, but but in terms of if you can get there early enough. Um, and I think this is not just something that happens in FND. This is probably a side effect of something that happens even in in health. So um, a really nice study uh, looked at um, functional connectivity of different parts of the brain, um, the somatosensory cortex, so the bit that's this kind of a map of your body across the middle, um, in people who had their arm immobilized uh, in a cast, a healthy arm, no injury, immobilized in a cast. Uh, and with, within hours, actually, there were changes in the connectivity uh, and, it, and it persisted after the cast had come off. So, so some of, there's some aberrant neuroplasticity is it aberrant? It's probably protective, it's probably a function for that, but it's going wrong in FND. Um, and the other thing that's, uh, I think, a bit more simple to understand, and this sometimes happens when somebody already has FND, um, they develop new triggers, they develop, uh, they become more avoidant, um, and they, they stop doing things and more symptoms appear uh, in, in a very kind of classical conditioning manner. So sort of like Pavlov's dogs hearing the bell, you know, and it's again involuntary, um, but, you know, kind of quite difficult to reverse. So this lady has developed a, a conditioned reaction to light. She gets a facial weakness, which isn't actually a weakness, it's a spasm of the muscle in which This looks like a facial weakness, but it's actually an extra movement rather than an absence of movement. There's a contraction of the autisma muscle inside of the face. And you can see why that's uh, problematic, because um, if you start developing symptoms when you're exposed to light, then obviously you would want to avoid light and you will put the sunglasses on and then, you know, try and stay in the dark. And then, the, of course, the more you do that, the more sensitive you become to that stimulus. Um, and it, it's really difficult for people to get, you know, it's very challenging to get out of that. Now, just as a sort of uh, a diversion, but I think it's a div diversion that you're all um, quite interested in probably is about uh, feigning. So what's the relationship between FND and uh, delivery, de deliberately produced or um, deliberately exaggerated symptoms? And I think it, this is really difficult. It's not really a medical issue. So, so 
you know, de deception, uh, feigning symptoms isn't, it's not a medical diagnosis, it's a behaviour. Um, and at the extremes, we see it in, um, I guess, two situations. So malingering, where somebody is purely putting on symptoms for material gain. Um, and then uh, a bit more medically, we would see it as part of a factitious disorder where somebody is um, deliberately producing symptoms um, or inducing illness for kind of very difficult to understand psychological purposes, um, uh, you know, usually as part of a, a, a severe personality disorder. Um, so I suppose I put this up because I was like, well, what, what actually, you know, we come against the limits of what my uh, nervous system and brain can tell about what's going on in your nervous system and that, that, you know, there's always a limit to that. We can't really tell what people's intentions are. Um, uh, the difficulty is that although FND is, is definitely not, well, it's not feigned, FND properly diagnosed, um, what we see is that patients have uh, the, the experiences that they describe and the clinical features that we see, they're very stable. Um, they're stable over, kind of historically stable, they're very familiar, they behave in very characteristic ways, and the onset is all, often quite characteristic as well. Um, patients tend to seek treatment um, and they engage with treatment, um, and sometimes they benefit from, you know, they benefit from treatment that's designed to treat FND, and I think that's probably not something that we would expect in people who are, who are feigning their, their illness. Um, and despite that, symptoms persist over many years and usually beyond the point that we would expect them to get any kind of short term gain. So, so, so that was what leads us to tend to think clinically that our FND patients aren't feigning. Um, there's also some experimental evidence, I don't have time to go into all of it here, um, showing kind of brain imaging dif differences between people who um, are are feigning, say, a tremor and who have a functional tremor, um, and including studies looking at people who also have a functional tremor and asking them to feign. It seems to be produced by different parts of the brain. So, so that's kind of clinically, we, we assume that our patients aren't, aren't um, feigning. And actually, for us, it probably doesn't matter too much because the treatment, we, we offer the treatment, if they benefit from the treatment, great. But for you, I can see that it really, really does matter. Um, and the difficulty we has, have is that the clinical signs, so for example, Hoover's sign, Hoover's sign is also positive in somebody who is just feigning a weak leg. Um, and that's a real, uh, you know, that, that that does cause us a difficulty. Um, so what information is helpful then? Um, and again, I don't think it's particularly a question for us, it's a question for, for, for you and everyone else in the courts. Um, and I think what what information is helpful is anything that indicates that somebody is deceiving you. So if somebody is saying, so, so we expect symptoms to be inconsistent, but if somebody is saying that they are bed bound, uh, and they're seen sort of going for a jog or, you know, or, or walking, then that is evidence that they are deceived. They are telling us something that is not the case. So that that's helpful. Um, and there are other things that are kind of supportive of, you know, they might suggest that somebody is exaggerating or, or making things up. And that would be um, kind of unusual patterns in the, you know, in the onset of symptoms and the trajectory or in the, the description of the symptoms. So somebody might, um, uh, you know, for example, have like terrible pain in an arm and yet uh, you'd be able to do all sorts of things with that arm that you just wouldn't expect somebody with that degree of pain pain to have. So there are suggestions, but again, it, I think it comes back to, is there evidence that this person is doing things that they're telling you that they, they can't do? Because my patients with FND generally they will say my symptoms are better at some times than others, they're better in some situations than others. And we, we expect that. And we also expect that when we're examining patients, when they for the reasons that I've shown you before, when they're focusing on the bad leg, it's probably that's probably the worst that it's probably seeing them at their at their worst. So so that was just a an aside. Uh, I imagine you have more questions about that, but I'm gonna move on to uh, epidemiology because this is important when you're thinking about uh, like the but for argument. So what, who do we think would have got FND anyway? Um, and most people, we, we don't think would get FND anyway. It's, it's not that common. So the incidence um, is probably about four, between four and 12 and 100,000 a year. Prevalence is about 50 and 100,000. So it's about the same as multiple sclerosis. Um, in terms of morbidity, so how bad is it? Uh, actually, all the studies suggest that it's worse in terms of the extent of disability, um, depression, um, sort of mis attached misery. FND is, is probably worse. Um, 
uh, and in neurology clinics, it's very, very common. So um, the, the big study, Scottish Neurological Symptoms Study back in the uh, uh, 90s, I think it was, um, uh, found that about a third of patients coming to neurology clinics had symptoms that were partially or totally unexplained by pathophysiological disease. Um, and if you tighten that in and look really narrowly at those who had FND and not sort of more gen general pain fatigue syndromes. It's probably about one in 20 going through neurology clinics. So, so we see it um, uh, a lot. Um, it, it's, it's kind of common, but also, it, you know, it's not that common. It's common as, an, as, as um, MS. Now, this slide is from a paper from a couple of years ago, Sarah Lidstone in Toronto. It's a, the biggest um, meta-analysis looking at the age and gender distribution of FND. And they also look at different uh, FND symptoms, which is quite interesting. So seizures, motor disorder, tremor. Um, uh, and, and I think the main thing that you'll see is that there's a, a great excess of women. So FND affects um, two or three women for every man. Uh, and but the other thing that you'll notice is that that gap closes at both ends of the, so uh, sorry, the bottom axis is age and the uh, axis on the left is um, numbers, counts of, of cases. So yeah, in childbearing age, so sort of, you know, in normal adulthood, much more women than men, uh, but in, in children and in elderly people, it's still more about women than men, but it's a, it's a lot closer. So, you know, we might, we, we might be more expecting to see um, new onset seizures in older men than we would in, in uh, younger men. And in children, it's probably a bit more, a bit more equal. Seizures are, are a bit different. They behave a bit differently. So there's a real peak in the late teens, early 20s of functional seizures. Um, uh, although we, we continue to see them up until people who are in their you know, 70s, 80s. Um, and more often, clinical experience is that suggests that um, the, the onset is to do with a medical event. So people who've been in hospital, they've had a, you know, their, their blood pressure tablets have gone up too high, they've had a faint and that's triggered off a sort of, so, so various medical things tend to trigger FND later in life. I just wanted to mention this uh, review that we wrote, a big group of us wrote, um, and I led uh, a year or two ago, um, because there's a, there's a, it's a really interesting issue that there is this excess of women and why might that be? Um, I think some of that is uh, sort of diagnostic bias. So uh, women are more likely to be uh, diagnosed with FND. That's bad for men also, because we see, and especially in medical legal cases, I've seen people, uh, men who've had very clearly in my eyes had FND and they've gone on and on and on without receiving a diagnosis for you know, uh, so long. <laughs> and it's because they've been, oh, they're a sort of normal guy. Why would they get FN? And it's, you know, there's a lot of biases that get in the way, a lot of stigma that gets in the way of people receiving the correct diagnosis. Um, some of the risk factors for FND are very gender weighted. Um, so uh, especially those involving violence, various socioeconomic disparities. Um, and there's probably a presentation bias as well. So um, men with functional symptoms are probably less likely to seek treatment than, than women are. Women go to the doctor more. And I added this, so this um, picture I just added, it's, it's not from the paper, it's from an uh, online journal that um, sort of did an did a, uh, article about the paper and just thought it looked really terrible. <laughs> it's such a, like a horrible picture. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, so what about trauma? So quite often the question will be, to this person has got all this bad stuff and then they've, you know, had been bumped in the car and then they've developed this. Well, what, would they have got FND anyway because of the bad stuff that's happened before? Um, and of course the background to that question kind of comes from the old conversion disorder hypothesis. So that's from Freud. He said that um, conversion symptoms was, are, you know, what was then FND, it was physical symptoms, uh, you know, so psychological distress um, being converted into physical symptoms. Um, and we've sort of done away with that hypothesis um, because we see people who develop FND who really there isn't any psychological trauma to, to speak of. Um, and there are other other things going on. Um, and, and because also why would why would something happening when you're sort of eight or 12 uh, cause you to suddenly develop symptoms much later in life? So lots of reasons that we've sort of done away with that. Um, and indeed the requirement for a psychological trauma or distress has been removed from the DSM-5, it was in the DSM-4. 
Um, but certainly there is an excess of trauma in patients with FND. Um, and this was uh, this is the, the best kind of meta analysis of uh, the available data. There's a lot of problems with this data because actually how do we ascertain whether somebody really has had trauma? So there are various horrible intrusive questionnaires um, and I suppose we're not sure uh, how people whether how honestly people respond to them. Um, but th these guys, uh, my colleague who's now back in Germany, Leah Ludwig, um, did the they've done really the best effort at it, I think. Um, and what they found is that, so if you look at the, what you look interested here is the odds ratio, so down that column there. Um, so the, yeah, so more likely to um, have experienced these things if you have FND compared to if you're a healthy person or a neurological, have a neurological disease of another sort. Um, and the odds ratio is uh, highest for emotional neglect. So really that, that seems to be the strongest link to um, but also it, it's over one, what you're looking for is over one, so you're more likely to um, sexual abuse and physical abuse, both in childhood and adulthood. But I think the interesting things to remember is, first, if we look at this sort of complicated statistics, but the PAF, the population attributable fraction, so how much of, you know, the statistical ca calculations can tell you how much of that risk factor Counts for that problem in that in, in this population. It's pretty low actually. So 15.1%, um, 16.9%. Um, so there's a lot of other things going on that are contributing to people getting FND that are that are not trauma. Um, and the other thing that's important to note from this study is that every single included study included cases of patients who had no history of trauma. So I think it's a risk factor. Um, it's important to be aware of. Uh, you know. Abuse and specifically neglect, which we I think was under recognised before, um, but it's it's not the whole story. Um, so and, and it, you know I just think that the fact of someone having experienced the trauma doesn't necessarily mean that um, that's the cause of their FND. And the other problem with this data is that actually the risk of exposure to the risk factor is very high. So one in twenty adults reports experiencing sexual abuse in childhood before 16. That's one in 30 men and one in 10 women. So it, that's common, FND relatively uncommon. So what about physical injury? So that would be most of the cases that I see people have had a bump or so, you know, some, some form of physical injury. Um, and we've recognised people developing functional symptoms after injury since about the 19th century. We had these slightly problematic descriptions of traumatic hysteria. Um, now, the biggest review um, uh, of the, the, the biggest review in terms of numbers of patients um, is from 2008, um, which looked at 900 patients um, who developed FND and found that about 40% of them uh, had a physical injury just prior to their symptom onset. But again, that's kind of a problem because how did they look for that data and you know, how, have the, how have those patients come to be written up? Um, so there's, there, there hasn't been anything looking prospectively. Um, and obviously, if you think about all the people that have injuries, <laughs> injuries are really common um, and the, the, the proportion of people. So, so we can't establish kind of causation from that, but it does seem to be a thing. And certainly clinically, sorry, uh, clinically, we see uh, really characteristic patterns of how the symptoms come on. Um, and I think that what's interesting when you're thinking about whether the injury can be, can be considered the trigger or the cause of the symptoms, um, you want to look at factors to do with the injury. So was it very minor? Was it very psychologically traumatic? And I think sometimes it's worth uh, noticing that something cannot appear that it's been particularly psychologically traumatic and yet, yet there's been something about it that's been particularly salient for that individual and whether that relates to past experience or whether that relates to dynamics in the workplace, um, you know, you get this sort of embitterment, from people who feel that they've really not been treated well and I think some all of these things can kind of feed into something being more catastrophic than it appears. The other things that are helpful is to look at the experience, the sort of peri-injury uh, symptoms that the patient describes. Um, because when somebody develops a, a new onset FND after something bad happening, um, they'll quite often describe uh, this peri-injury dissociation. So this kind of weird separate feeling. They feel, you know, that they'll be like, I just didn't feel like myself. 
problem in legal cases where there's been a head injury is that, so that sometimes gets mixed up with people think that's PTA, post-traumatic amnesia, and it's, re it's a different thing. It's a weird feeling, but they've still had the ability to lay down new, new information. Um, and the other thing that can happen is when you look at the trajectory afterwards, people develop sort of catastrophic injury beliefs. They start um, avoiding activities. And so where if you look at somebody who's had a severe brain injury, for example, what we expect the trajectory to be is that things are really bad. They're really disabled really, you know, in intensive care, perhaps for a bit. And then things only get better. They just generally, if you've had even a bad TBI, unless you're unlucky enough to have a late complication, generally things will only get better. They get better again slowly, then quickly, then slowly again. And if you have a mild injury, so a kind of concussion, you expect to just get better just get better so and the majority of people do just get better but you get this group of people that develop functional symptoms afterwards and they get this sort of snowballing and, and when you go into it you can just hear what's happened they've gone and they've taken to bed for a week and um, they've developed all sorts of um, anxiety um, avoidance uh, they've started taking lots of unhelpful medications so looking at these kind of timelines is really helpful when you're thinking about uh, causation and then the big question uh, is what happens next? How do we establish prognosis? How do we tell who's going to get better and who's not going to get better? And when can we when can we decide that? And again, there are lots of problems with the uh, with the literature here. Um, in terms of we don't have we don't have very much prospective data. So the biggest uh, prospective data is from the Scottish Neurological Symptoms Study, and that looked at patients with mixed functional disorders. So they had pain, fatigue, all sorts of things, including FND. Um, and when they followed them up over a year, 67% um, of them were either the same or worse. So it was bad. It was really bad. And the poor outcome was predicted by two things: by um, financial benefits, welfare benefits and uh, negative illness beliefs, so uh, kind of catastrophic illness beliefs, believing that you're never going to get better. So the more recent uh, research, um, so one of my colleagues, Jeanette Galau from the Netherlands, did a systematic review in 2014, and she looked at kind of all of the data, including that study, but, but all of the data, uh, and looking more specifically at functional neurological disorder rather than just functional disorders as a big, as a big mass. Um, and again, it was it was pretty bad. So um, fewer than 50 percent of patients uh, seemed to achieve remission. Um, and the ones that had the positive outcome, people who did well, the predictors were a short duration of symptoms um, and uh, being a child. So children tend to do a bit better. Um, outside of childhood, there's no effect of age or gender in prognosis. So women and men for all ages doing sort of equally badly. Um, and Janetta uh, did a really nice um, analysis of uh, John Stone's data of um, functional limb weakness patients uh, over 14 years. So this is prospective data. So this is kind of the most methodologically sound um, follow up study of FND. And they followed up 107 patients over after 14 years. And um, what you see here is the so improved. Um, so remitted, if you look at the dark green, that's people who've got completely, completely better. And it was the same in uh, functional neurological disorder as it was in neurological controls. So patients who had strokes, multiple sclerosis, other causes of function, or other causes of limb weakness. Um, so no difference in the proportion you'd improved. And it was really low. So 20 percent, only 20 percent got better. 80 percent um, were. Uh, but then when we look at the proportion improved, the functional limb weakness, they're a bit more likely to be a bit better. So most of them still had their weakness. Some of them are a bit better, but but really it's pretty, pretty grim, I think. Sorry, and I, sh I should also say, it's so she looked at predictors and interestingly, she did not find that financial benefits or illness beliefs were particularly strong predictors, smaller data sets. So I'm not sure if that would um, be important in a bigger data set, but in terms of baseline, um, somatization disorder, so having multiple functional symptoms uh, in different systems seem to predict a poor outcome um, at baseline. So if, you, if you'd already had lots of other symptoms and you got FND, you're more likely to do badly. But when we think about, um, if we're going to think about people's other symptoms, 
and people's illness behaviours when we're thinking about prognosis. I think it's really important to remember to look at baseline data. So actually, uh, lots of symptoms, having lots of symptoms is actually quite common. Um, and I've included, I just thought this was really nice data from a big um, Glasgow uh, COVID study. Uh, and sorry, it's a busy chart, but I'm going to point out the key data. So this is looking at symptoms in people who were never infected with COVID, people who had an asymptomatic infection, and people who had a symptomatic infection. Um, and what I'm interested here is people that never had COVID, uh, 62, like nearly 63,000 of them, uh, nearly 32% had had uh, tiredness in the last week, 20% headaches, 16% muscle aches and weakness, 14% joint pain. This is Scottish data. So we're really, we're really ill. <laughs> people have a lot of symptoms. So, and, and then sometimes I'm conscious that when you're reading reports and people have really picked through, it feels like a bit unfair actually, you know, um, and if we look at other things, so irritable bowel syndrome, 10 to 25% population prevalence, um, chronic pain. So we think 18% uh, of relatively young people have some form of chronic pain, and that's over 50% of over, over 75 year olds. And if you look at moderate to severe disabling chronic pain, it's a bit lower, but it's still 10 to 15 percent. So I just think it's important to remember the baseline of, of these things. And, and the other thing that can happen is that different bias can, if you're looking at, for example, attending GPs, if you're to count someone's GP attendance as well, women attend the GP much more because they have babies and they seek contraception. And there are all sorts of other, all sorts of things that can get in, involved there when you're, when you're gonna sort of start adding up people's symptoms. Um, and I brought this up partly for reassurance, but also just to make you think about actually, what are we, um, you know, what are we, what are we attributing significance to? So this was, um, I got some medical students to do, this was a nice paper we did um, a couple of years ago. Um, and I got medical students to survey sort of robustly healthy young adults in South Edinburgh, most of them postgraduates or um, recent graduates, about how often they experience various kind of cognitive lapses. And again, really, really, really often. Um, and, and yet you would read in reports, you'd say, oh, it's, this person has difficulties finding the word. It must be their brain injury. So, so base rates are really important. And I just want to finish on a sort of positive uh, a, a positive note to talk a little bit about treatment. And um, I bring this up because um, I'm conscious that it's probably a bit confusing. Sometimes we recommend physiotherapy and sometimes we recommend cognitive behavioural therapy for, for what appears to be exactly the same thing. And I just wanted to kind of go into a bit why that might be and how, what our approach to treatment is in FND. So the first thing that you want to do if you're I, it's quite satisfying thinking about treatment in FND because actually when you start to unpick things, you can often find lots of different targets. So people have got so much going on. Um, you know, there's just so much going on. And if you pit, start to pick it about, uh, apart, it becomes less of a kind of massive misery and a bit more, well, actually you can work on this and work on this. Um, so the, the key, I think, in a lot of cases is this fear avoidance cycle on the left. So people are scared of going out in case they get, you know, in case they trip or fall or and they see someone and they stay in the house, they get more anxious, they get deconditioned, they get more, you know, so this horrible cycle and it happens all the time, um, not just in patients with FND. And the other thing that can happen is that they, they focus more on their symptoms, the symptoms get worse, uh, the pain gets worse, everything gets worse. Um, so, so if you unpick this, sometimes you can find things that are making it worse. So anything that kind of causes a sort of turning up of your nervous system, um, so comorbid mental illness, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, they're, they're really treatable usually. Um, not always, but they're often really treatable. And if you, if you get in there and treat them, there's a good chance that you're going to help the person's FND. To get into the fear avoidance cycle, so there's kind of two different ways. And some people really like talking treatment. They like going through something every week with a cognitive behavioural therapist. Um, so that's one way of ta tackling that cycle. Um, but another way, some people just want to be sort of got out of their seat with the physiotherapist. And it actually, you know, all the studies that we've looked at of, for example, chronic fatigue, um, it seems that it, the sort of modulator is, is that reduction of fear avoidance. So whatever you do to get there, whether it's physio or cognitive behavioural therapy, that's, that's what you need to be getting into. Sometimes people have really strong beliefs about their injury um, and cognitive behavioural therapy can be quite helpful about that. So people will say, my brain is rotting or, you know, my, my, you know, all sorts of things. And sometimes it's something that they've picked up that an orthopaedic surgeon has 
sort of told them in a not very helpful way and they've, they've really latched onto it. Um, nerve damage, that's about it. And then the last one, emotional mitigation, which is tough. Just, just clinically, it seems to have a horrible effect on people. Um, and I guess that's your, it's your job to try and get people through it as quickly as possible. Um, but, but everybody I see says, I just wish I'd never started. <laughs> um, so, um, so that, and I'm going to finish up with um, just a couple of um, pointers to a couple of resources. So neurosymptoms.org is really helpful for if you've got clients with FND, they probably already know about it. It's a website and an app that's got lots of helpful information about FND on it, but it's also quite interesting. Um, I, I check in on it every now and again because John's always putting up new videos and, um, and resources that are quite helpful. Um, and if, if you're interested in reading more about the sort of history and the, the science behind FND, um, FND Portal is actually a, a person with FND that lives in America. He's very sort of erudite and does some, has done some really excellent writing that I, I would recommend. Um, so have a look at that. And um, there's a link again to my uh, references um, and to, to some of the papers I've cited. Um, we really happy to take any questions. Okay, that's fine. Any questions? Just now, we can come back to the Our first meeting speaker today is Thomas Mohawk. Thomas is an advocate that I know fairly well as we dabble together and talk together last year. He is one of Art Manager's personal injury specialists and has a particular expertise in art injury disputes and historic child abuse. Prior to calling the bar, he made nine years of experience as a solicitor. Primarily representing both pursuers and defenders in personal injury actions. He also works on professional negligence cases, commercial cases, credit card cases. Uh, Tom is one of the people that I have personally asked for advice from on several occasions, so I can tell you that he is a very knowledgeable and details oriented advocate. Tom is here to talk to you about how to prepare as a functional neurological disorder case in terms of what should be done pre injury and the panel will be on that. Sorry, if everyone can bear with me for just a wee moment, I'll need to swap across to my slides. So just take a little second. Sorry, break after my... Thank you. So before I begin, uh, I do know you were promised a break. Um, so uh, I promise this is actually quite a short presentation. I've timed it. It's only about half an hour. So uh, perhaps an extended break uh, after I'm done and then we can go into Jonathan directly after. Um, so I think it uh, really, thank you very much, Jonathan, for your uh, introduction. And more importantly, thank you all very much for coming along to the launch for the Arnott Manderson Personal Injury Lawyers Group. It's been a long time uh, coming and there's been a lot of work done in the background. So thank you to everyone for that hard work. I have to admit I have the unenviable uh, task of going in the middle. Um, I will be blunt. My slideshow presentation is very low tech. It doesn't have videos um, and uh, bluntly Jonathan's slideshow uh, game is much better than mine. So you can look forward to that. Now, as I'm not that long out of practice, I thought it would probably be not a bad idea for me to take a slightly more practical look at this uh, from the view of uh, pre-litigation and in particular, sort of t taking a starting point of a hypothetical pursuer coming to you that doesn't yet have a formal diagnosis of functional neurological disorder. So um, apologies to the defenders in the room. I'm going to be putting a pursuer hat on for the uh, start of the presentation. I do promise I'll balance that out at the end by coming back to 
looking at it from the defender's angle. But if we start with pursuers, I uh, began with a very basic definition of uh, functional neurological disorders. Obviously, Dr. McWhirter has covered this in a, a lot more detail, uh, and I wouldn't propose to go into it other than to note uh, the basic definition appears to be functional neurological disorder. Uh, FND describes a problem with how the brain receives and sends information to the rest of the body. And again, I've, I've popped the wee link uh, on the slides for a bit of further research. Um, I suspect uh, Dr. McWhirter's um, research tools will be of more use than the NHS, perhaps, but uh, nonetheless, a good starting point for me. Part of looking at this as an area for today's talks and presentations is uh, experience amongst the bar and colleagues that I've spoken to that this is becoming a lot more prevalent in the Scottish legal market. And I trust that's probably a, a viewpoint that's shared amongst the audience. Um, this is becoming something that we have to be more and more aware of and uh, taking a structured approach from the outset, in my view, is quite important. Uh, the structure of my talk will start with symptom, symptoms to be vigilant for. Um, we'll then go into the importance of early diagnosis, evidence capture, uh, further investigation reports, uh, early settlement discussions. Now that's where the defender heart hatch will start to come back out again. Uh, suspicions of fraud and qualified one way cost shifting. That's where I'll firmly put the defender hat back on my head. Uh, and then I have also allowed for some questions, but Jonathan is quite correct. We have uh, questions at the end, so I'll hold off on those and let you go away for coffees. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, symptoms to be vigilant for. Before I launch into this, uh, someone who's very good at public speaking once advised me that uh, you shouldn't over clutter your slides, you should let your beautiful voice do the talking for you. Uh, I'm going to depart from that advice today for uh, two very important reasons. Uh, firstly, because the slides ought to be generally available and hopefully would uh, serve as a sort of an aid memoir uh, after the event. And secondly, I'm hoping that discussing the common symptoms will help lodge them uh, in everybody's brain, mine included, uh, as something of a bit of a trigger to think about uh, while you're speaking to the uh, hypothetical pursuer or a family member and they mention something about this. Um, now, some of these are quite severe symptoms and you think, right, OK, that would automatically trigger a thought in my brain, but other, others are a bit more subtle, a bit less obvious, and um, we'll go through the list in detail, uh, not touching on causation, obviously, to, uh, we have a, an expert here that's a lot more qualified to discuss that than I, but nonetheless, I think it's useful to go through the list in a bit of detail. And uh, I'm very grateful to Dr. McWhirter for those videos, because frankly, those will probably stick in your mind much better than me just talking about it. But you have items such as limb weakness, and again, it was an excellent video uh, to demonstrate that. Seizures and tremors, those were noted in the video. Dystonia, now uh, my understanding, and again, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but uh, that's a spasm resulting in sort of clenched muscles that can't be unclenched uh, by the affected individual and remain that way for uh, a, an extended period of time. Uh, gait disorders, we had uh, some videos for those, so I don't propose to look at that in any great detail. We had uh, facial spasms, ticks, jerks and twitches. And then uh, drop attacks. Uh, this was something that uh, I went away to do a little bit of research on, and much to my horror, the uh, description of it online was uh, that of effectively a bit like someone uh, that's a puppet with their strings being cut. They just simply drop to the ground, remaining fully conscious. Uh, but unable to uh, control their body. Um, that one uh, certainly uh, filled me with the horror of the idea. Um, then we have the, again, the slightly more subtle ones that I'd mentioned earlier, sensory symptoms, your pins and needles, limb disassociation. And again, disassociation seems to be a, a slightly wider, uh, more prevalent symptom in uh, functional neurological disorder. You then have the cognitive memory issues, speech and swallowing issues, uh, functional dizziness. Now, my understanding again is that this is a constant dizziness that uh, refuses to go away. It's not just a, a sudden and quick bout, uh, it's uh, sustained functional dizziness. Um, visual issues, I believe we touched on that uh, briefly earlier. Photophobia and then the general disassociation symptoms of that sort of out of body feeling 
uh, like one might get when addressing uh, a room full of experienced lawyers on a topic that one is relatively new to. Um, then we also have a list of commonly associated symptoms, uh, items such as chronic pain, fibromyalgia, back and neck pain, uh, complex regional pain syndrome, persistent fatigue, sleep problems, uh, that includes getting too much and not enough, uh, a problem that many of us in the legal profession probably have in terms of not enough. Uh, but anyway, we have migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, and then I think we have a, a trifecta in terms of uh, psychological symptoms, which I think just even taking a, a layman's approach and a step back, it's probably quite understandable that somebody who is experiencing changes in how their body reacts and responds in day to day life and frankly refusing to obey instructions um, that they would find that to be particularly traumatic. So I, I would suggest that it's not at all surprising that uh, anxiety, panic attacks, depression and even PTSD uh, may come about as a result. You also have finally, uh, you'll be pleased to know I'm coming towards the end of the list, uh, chronic urinary retention, which I believe is also sometimes diagnosed as Fowler's condition or Fowler's disease and dysfunctional breathing. Now, that's a whistle stop tour through some of the more common items and uh, bluntly, I'll, I'll move on to the next slide because this is cross crossover and subjectivity. You might all be looking at me going, Tom, that's all very fine and well, but frankly, if my client comes to me with photosensitivity, the first thing I'm going to do is say, get to the GP for an emergency appointment or the hospital, you might have meningitis. Um, there are a number of crossovers that we'll all be aware of from dealing with clin clinical negligence cases where, frankly, you might say that a lot of these symptoms are caused by or are indicative of other problems. And then even beyond that, as Dr. McWhorter noted earlier, some of these symptoms are almost entirely self-reported. Some of them, and I've listed, for example, drop attacks, dystonia, tremors, those are, those are independently verifiable. You can look at somebody with facial tics and tremors and you can say, I can, I can verify that with my own perception. As Dr. McWhorter said, though, there is an upper limit to that in terms of items that can be tested, such as the out of body feelings or um, sensitivity on the, the skin, those sorts of items. And I think this then moves on to my first key point of advice and what jumped out at me in terms of preparing this talk uh, from a pursuer's perspective and from the an agent advising and dealing with a potential uh, FND case. There is, I think, to my mind, a requirement to test pursue as evidence and take a step back in your own role as their advisor to assess their credibility and reliability throughout the process just to be a little bit more objective with these types of cases which then brings me on to the idea of trying to build that evidential chain uh, on a pre-litigation basis now for me I would say that it's probably quite important to try and get an early diagnosis and work out where you are uh, on an early basis. Now, that is immediate uh, engagement with the general practitioner, I think has to be the logical starting point to investigate whatever symptoms have uh, cropped up as part of the case. Now, I think there was a, this was touched on earlier in terms of the difficulties in terms of getting diagnoses potentially for, for example, males. And um, we all know from practice that the NHS is struggling somewhat in terms of timelines, funding, and frankly, sometimes in getting onwards referral from a GP to the correct pathway and eventually ending up on the, uh, the desk of someone like Dr. McWhorter. So, I think as legal advisors, it's probably good if we recommend to pursuers uh, that they continue to sustain engagement and involvement with the investigations into their symptoms, because if it's a particularly long term process, you might be looking at this with a view to a pursuer turning around to you and saying, look, I just can't be bothered anymore. I'm just going to learn to live with this. Um, and that's certainly a conversation I remember from practice having with uh, pursuers that were frankly fed up with the process. 
So encouraging perseverance with trying to work out what's happening with them, I think is, is pretty important. Beyond that, and thinking about the evidence chain more uh, generally, you have uh, evidence capture. Um, items such as statements from the family that can provide additional evidence to talk about the symptoms. You also have video and photographic evidence. And um, the first time I ran this talk in front of my wife, she said, excuse me, I just want to clarify. Are you suggesting that if someone has a drop attack, the first thing the family member should do is pull out their phone and get a video of it? And I thought, right, no, I need to <laughs> expand this out and make sure that I'm being uh, clear in what I'm saying. Um, it's more to do with the idea that, uh, and again, I'm perhaps a bit of an old fuddy-duddy in this regard. Um, I'm under my understanding is TikTok is a thing of young people filming life that goes around them on a, a regular basis. Um, and uh, that sort of spills into the slightly more independent side of things. We are, as a general rule, without realising it in our day-to-day -day lives, probably caught on CCTV cameras uh, throughout our day. And if you have somebody that has an attack or a, a drop attack of tremors that are some way caught on uh, a video or via photograph, then that is an excellent source of uh, independent evidence that can be provided on to uh, both the experts from an investigation standpoint, but also the experts from the causation and medical legal standpoint. And we'll come on to that uh, in a moment. Uh, again, I've noted the tests from medical professionals to do with functional weakness, memory tests, cognitive tests, etc. Again, we had some excellent videos of those earlier, so I wouldn't uh, propose to go into those uh, further. And then we have the first of my um, shameless plugs. Um, I probably should have announced this at the start. My talk has several uh, points where I will be um, suggesting to you that you could consider the expertise of counsel, uh, preferably from the Arnott Manderson Personal Injury Lawyers Group. Um, they are available, but we won't talk about them. Um, but nonetheless, uh, in terms of counsel's role uh, at the point of instructing an expert, uh, we're available um, to be consulted on a pre-litigation basis, as well as once uh, proceedings have been raised. Which then brings us on to the actual um, obtaining of a causation report. And again, we have, uh, and this is more of a plug for Dr. McWhorter than it is for myself, but um, we, there are plenty of suitably qualified expert witnesses that can be uh, instructed to assist with the diagnosis uh, to cover off contributory factors, try and as best as they can give a long term prognosis and also identify what the likely long term functional limitations will be, because that uh, and we're starting to get into more familiar ground here as uh, personal injury practitioners, that will give you an idea of what further investigations are needed from a medical legal perspective into items such as quantum, which is the next slide, which is depending on your functional limitations and your long term prognosis moving forward, you're looking at your vocational experts uh, for your loss of earnings and also potentially for your disadvantage on the open labour market, although that may well be a matter for someone for Dr McWhorter to also comment on. Um, your actuaries for your loss of pension reports. Uh, if you're looking at somebody that is going to have disadvantage in the long term and going to be unable to function and care for themselves, you're then looking at items such as care reports. And finally, and linking back to earlier in the talk, if you have issues such as PTSD or other further linked psychological injuries, you can consider other uh, causation and uh, expert medical legal reports from there. Now, uh, I've popped this slide in here because it's more of a sort of a link on to the next part of the talk, which is, as you will likely or all have gathered, the potential value on these types of claims can be quite large, particularly if an individual has severe ongoing functional day-to-day -day limitations, is removed from the job market or will be disadvantaged on the job market moving forward or require uh, long-term care, you're now going to be getting into your Ogden table type calculations for the rest of the pursuer's life. And particularly if you're looking at a, a younger pursuer, the size of potential settlement values for these types of claims can be quite large. Again, another shameless plug, we're here to help in terms of um, notes on quantum and giving advice 
on uh, reasonable settlement values. Now we're back to the defender side of things and firmly putting our defender hat on. Um, this is a slightly smaller part of the talk, given uh, by the time it lands on a defender's desk, uh, investigations ought to be quite well advanced. But nonetheless, if there are any early indicators that we're looking at some kind of functional neurological disorder case, I would suggest you want to engage with this early and that that will inevitably involve some kind of investigation of the pursuer as an individual. As Dr. McWhorter said, if you have a pursuer that says I'm bedbound and they're caught on camera running the London Marathon, you want to know about that as early as possible. And frankly, as a defender, you want to be feeding that back to the pursuer as early as possible to get that case uh, off everybody's desk. Um, bluntly, nobody has an interest in putting forward fraudulent claims, either from the pursuer's end or the defender's end. And if there is any suggestion of that, that ought to be as investigated and brought to light as quickly as possible. Uh, and that will involve careful consideration of the evidence presented. I don't want to uh, tread too much into Jonathan's talk, but I have had the benefit of having had a look at his slides and where the court has given consideration of surveillance, they take a slightly more nuanced and balanced uh, view. So really, at that point, you might want to consider the instruction of your own functional neurological disorder expert to review any evidence that you might have recovered with a view to asking them about whether that actually changes the diagnosis and whether what has been caught on camera, for example, actually in reality undermines that particular pursuer's credibility and reliability. Because bluntly, as the lay people in this to a certain extent, whilst we can advise on the legal side of things, really we want to be making sure that even something that might look obvious to us as a fraud is actually one uh, and that there isn't some other medical explanation that covers off the evidence that's been uh, obtained. And again, another plug, we've got instruction of counsel to consider gaps in the chain of evidence. If we please know we're getting there, we're nearly at the end of the talk. Um, early settlement. Uh, to my mind, if you're going to look to try and settle this on a pre-litigation basis, particularly in these types of cases, there ought to be early disclosure of all evidence from the pursuer to the defender, including everything you're relying on from test results, videos and uh, photos. That could then lead to a consideration by the defender of how they want to settle matters. Um, now, I would pause to observe at this stage that particularly in, in relation to pre-litigation, bluntly in terms of settling matters, the world is your oyster. Uh, you can consider items such as periodic payments, um, particularly if the prognosis period, or sorry, the prognosis for the individual pursuer is actually quite positive. So it may well be the case that um, uh, preliminary settlement can be discussed subject to how the pursuer's condition develops uh, over the short to medium term, possibly even verging into the long term. Uh, my understanding, and again, Dr. McWhorta, please correct me, is that sometimes you do have spontaneous remissions where people just get better. Um, and if that's the case and you're the defender and you're looking at talking over several million pounds as a lump sum, I might suggest that you uh, might have some uh, regret if uh, the day after the deal is done, the pursuer goes into sudden remission and is functionally fine again. Uh, again, I would say this is the final plug, but there's one more. Uh, you could consider the instruction of counsel to advise on ideas on concepts of the periodic payments and litigation risk. Finally, and this is firmly with the defender's hat on my head, if the functional neurological symptoms are being manufactured by the pursuer, this would, uh, subject to obviously a finding by the court to that effect, be uh, to my mind an exception to the qualified one-way cost shifting rules that we are all undoubtedly aware of. I've popped the, uh, the excerpt from the rules in there, but bluntly, quarks protection would be stripped away from somebody that has manufactured these symptoms. Now, given the expenses consequences in terms of the various reports required to uh, investigate this, this would be a potentially large sum of money uh, to be awarded against an individual pursuer or, as the case may be, uh, a body financing the pursuer's case. 
the reality of where we are in terms of the Scottish legal market, particularly in relation to courts, is uh, this won't be a surprise what I'm saying to anyone in the room. We're all very much anticipating the guidance coming out of the court on how this is going to work in practice, particularly with the area of uh, functional neurological disorders. I would expect some interest in further clarification from the court, and this might be a, an extra area that uh, certain defenders might seek to try and take a point on. Uh, particularly in trying to get an authority that would serve as a warning uh, to individuals that manufacture these types of symptoms. Uh, again, I'll return to my earlier thought, which was bluntly, it doesn't help any of us to have a fraudulent claim, so they need to be investigated carefully and uh, with care and consideration towards the injured party in case it's not a fraudulent claim, but nonetheless robustly by both parties at an early stage to avoid uh, getting into hot water later. So that brings me on to my closing thoughts. Um, these cases are complicated. They require special care and extra management, uh, to my mind, from solicitors. This is the final plug. You'll be happy to hear. I'm personally happy to discuss further if anyone has any specific cases in mind. And Jonathan Brody will go on to give a talk that is specific to items to consider once the proceedings have actually been raised. My final slide says questions, and uh, I'd invite you to ignore the bit at the bottom right where it says, again, I'm not doing this talk again, so uh, you can ask questions of me uh, at the Q and answer, the questions and answers session, but thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay, thank you everyone for attending. Our last speaker today is John Brody Casey. Jonathan has almost 30 years of experience at the bar, with 14 years of experience as senior counsel. Jonathan was the director of Arnold Anderson for eight years and has only recently stood down after his appointment as property leader in the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. He is one of Arnold Anderson's personal injury specialists, but also has a wide and varied practice, including professional negligence, judicial review, and planning and heritage. Jonathan also worked in the Crown Office for four years as a senior advocate deputy and then as deputy Crown Counsel for the Health and Safety Division. During this time, he represented the Crown at the Supreme Court on three occasions, including the Lord Advocate's written intervention in the case of Julian Sanjay Singh. A junior to him in several personal injury cases, and can tell you that Jonathan is a very conscientious and analytical litigator. Jonathan is here to talk to you about the practical points in conducting a case involving functional neurological disorder. Thank you, Jonathan. After that introduction, I feel as I should just exit because I don't think things are going to get any better. Um, the genesis in my mind for this talk was the fact that I have had um, the great benefit of consulting with, I suppose, Scotland's four preeminent clinicians in this area, and that is Professor John Stone, Professor Alan Carson, Dr Laura McWhorter, and Dr Alistair Rooney. And these have been in cases where the concept of functional neurological disorder was new to me, the issues raised by it seem to be confusing and contradictory. And on both sides, pursuer and defender, quite how we were going to present our evidence were matters of confusion to me. That was interesting, but it poses the practical difficulty of how one addresses these issues. And they were greatly facilitated by the fact that um, I had the opportunity various cases of being able to consult with the quartet. But um, today's talk is personal in the sense that a lot of it really is centered around experiences that I have had. And I thought that I would use them, bring them together, share them with you as examples of things that in the course of litigation where functional neurological disorder has become a diagnosis or an issue that I have had to think about. So let me start with this case, Kerr against Steel Facilities Limited. Now, 
it is 14 years old, so you might be slightly surprised that I'm starting with a case that's 14 years old. Um, slightly surprisingly, certainly to me, for the number of times functional neurological disorder has um, been a factor in the case, slightly to my surprise, there are not that many decided cases that have involved functional neurological disorder. This one is interesting for the fact that the um, evidence raised and the, re and the decision from Lord Hodge uh, raised a lot of the issues that I've then seen emerging in other cases. Now, it's 2009 and we were talking about conversion disorder and we were talking about DSM-4, so to a certain extent it's out of date, but um, conversion disorder essentially functional neurological disorder and for the pursuer in that case the expert was John Stone and the judge Lord Hodge as we all know deputy president of the Supreme Court but at that stage in the other house brought together therefore an excellent expert and an excellent judge let's look at the facts minor accident at work that should read after which the pursuer developed pain and many varied symptoms sensory and motor disturbance of limbs fatigue impaired memory and concentration and bladder problems pursuer had consulted many doctors they considered him to be genuine but no organic injury or disease was found and the medics were really having difficulty explaining what was going on Mottled appearance of a left arm, it was cold to touch, hypersensitivity, tremors present. Family evidence, there had been a dramatic change to the pursuer from pre to post accident days. Surveillance evidence showed generally normal mo mobility, save for a limp, and occasional protecting of the left arm, whereas when examined, constant protection of the protecting the left arm and in surveillance evidence didn't really show signs of significant pain. Unsurprisingly, perhaps the defenders at proof went for the credibility and reliability of the pursuer big time and pointed to the surveillance evidence as showing up many and very dramatic um, disparities with what was being said to all the clinicians. And perhaps rather foolishly, the defender's um, principal um, expert psychiatrist uh, was somewhat disparaging of uh, Dr. Stone's ability to um, get into any area of psychiatry, more fool the defender's expert. It was 2009. Conversion disorder, functioning neurological disorder was largely misunderstood by litigators at that stage and possibly also by many doctors. So the issues that were arising in this case, when I say that, this really stems, and it's a summary from Dr. Stone's evidence to the court, but the issues that he was discussing in his evidence, there are multiple diagnoses here. Uh, complex regional pain syndrome, somatoform pain disorder, depression and conversion disorder. And I'm reading for conversion disorder here, FND, because that is what was being talked about. Um, the evidence that had been reviewed by Dr. Stone, the pursuer's account, a clinical examination, evidence from family members, full consideration of medical records, all the medical reports that had been generated, evidence from work colleagues was also available, both of the circumstances of the accident, and Dr. McWhorter was talking about how the um, circumstances of the accident can be a relevant consideration because an accident that may objectively be somewhat minor may be perceived for good reason by the patient as being considerably um, more threatening. Um, and DWP records, benefits claims had gone in, the account being given by the pursuer seemed to be significantly at odds with the surveillance and of course I mentioned the surveillance. So um, Dr. Stone was challenged by the defender psychiatrist for not having expertise in psychiatry to opine on the psychiatric component of conversion disorder and somatoform pain disorder and Stone by original training at least was a neurologist. Um, the surveillance evidence, I've talked about that already, variable presentation but there was evidence of major discrepancies and I've talked about that. Dr Stone accepted that there was an exaggeration of symptoms when one compared the surveillance to what he, Dr Stone, had been told 
and there was a discrepancy between the surveillance and the account given by the pursuer in the DWP records. So one can see why a defender might be thinking, no, 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 this, this is exaggeration, at least, if not out and out malingering. Now, Lord Hodge accepted Dr Stone's reasoning and his opinion. He really accepted Dr Stone's evidence in its entirety. And when it came to the reasoning given by Lord Hodge, this is a summation of it. And he, Lord Hodge, was saying, well, it's examination, findings of particular relevance to conversion disorder, functioning neurological disorder, weakness in arm and leg, difficulty controlling limbs and ways in which the pursuer attempted to align his body. Dr Stone had seen these particular features at clinical examination as being relevant to coming to make a final diagnosis of FND and Lord Hodge having been essentially pop. And we'll come back to this idea of the expert being an educator for the lawyers and an educator for the court. Dr Stone had really taught Lord Hodge through this. Um, um, Dr Stone had also um, addressed the repeated attendance on doctors by the pursuer, with the pursuer seeking explanation for the conditions. He was always wanting an explanation for what was wrong with them. Um, Lord Hodge accepted that that was a factor that was relevant coming to an opinion, coming to a diagnosis of FND. Um, and then Lord Hodge, again, through the explanation given by Dr Stone, yes, Dr Stone said, apparently bizarre symptoms, but I, I can find that entirely consistent with the diagnosis. But these bizarre symptoms were not the sort of thing that one might read up on the internet so as to feign the condition. They were so peculiar to that particular individual. Um, symptoms, the nature of the complaint varied. That was okay, said Dr Stone. It's recognized with um, conversion disorder, functional neurological disorder, that there may be variability from day to day, that the patient's function symptoms may be better when not focused on uh, the body part in question, and the patient is often worse in at the time of clinical examination. Yes, Dr Stone had said the video surveillance does show exaggeration, but it's not, but, it, but overall what I'm seeing, Dr Stone had said, is not incompatible with my findings at examination of limb function, and it's recognised that patients may exaggerate to clinicians as part of a genuine desire to obtain an answer solution, not to obtain money, but to get an answer for what um, they're suffering. And the third party evidence that Dr Stone had gone through in detail, family and colleagues. Family and colleagues were found to be credible and reliable as witnesses. They were speaking to um, functional problems for the pursuer and Lord Hodge took that on board as part of uh, Dr Stone's reasoning as to why um, it was appropriate to arrive at the diagnosis. And then uh, Lord Hodge also noted that Dr Stone had given proper consideration to the possibility of malingering, um, but that malingering had been excluded under reference to accepting that condition may vary from time to time, the overall consistency in the family to colleagues account with clinical findings. So Steele, um, I find to be in terms of Scottish cases, the fullest consideration of the very sort of issues that Dr McWhorter has been talking about, even though we're going back to 2009. Many of you may be aware of the case of Cossey from last year. That actually is a somatoform disorder diagnosis and is not as interesting because it didn't specifically deal with FND. And also that case was more to do with exacerbation. So there had been all sorts of um, symptoms prior to the index event. The issue was actually whether post-index event, anything was worse. So that's why I've not got into COSI. Um, I've then um, taken um, four cases of my own. None of these went to proof, um, and I've anonymized them for a variety of reasons, um, and they will stay anonymous. But I'm, I'm listing these because these are examples of the sorts of things that have cropped up, <coughs> excuse me, 
in cases in which I've been involved, where functional neurological disorder has either been the diagnosis or is thought to be a possible diagnosis. The first of these, the pursuer fell and sustained a minor injury to the left arm and left ankle in February of 2021. That's the index event. During 2021 and into 2022, there were increasing symptoms of pain, numbness and weakness in left arm and then left leg, no evidence of injury or disease. The experts, a neurologist for the pursuer, a neuropsychiatrist for the defender, in fact, that was um, Professor Carson, a neuropsychiatrist, um, agreed that the accident had triggered functional neurological disorder. And so we thought, I was pursuing, fine, we can get on and settle this case at quite a lot of money because the pursuer was um, relatively young and our argument was, was not going to be going back to work. However, um, diligent, though in one sense, very unhelpful updating of medical records, recovered an entry for October 2020, remember the index accident was February 2021. Um, GP attendants, the pursuer having attended with a minor injury to the left wrist, and then two weeks later came back again. And then there was nothing in terms of GP attendances until the February. The updating records were sent to Professor Carson. He said, ah, having seen the entry for October 2020, I now think actually that in terms of causation, FND has been triggered prior to the index event of February 2021. I think by that, minor accident in October 2020. And so my opinion is, in fact, that the index event has not triggered the FND. It's not even exacerbated it because it was on a trajectory that was just going to continue. Uh, I had the neurologist and I felt outgunned by the neuropsychiatrist and the analysis. And so the claim that looked as though it might have had quite a lot of value to it because we were failing to establish a position, no longer had very much value to it. Um, C against D, um, I came, I'm, um, there's a background to this, the defender's agents change because the defender's original agents um, were um, dissolving and it was passed to um, new agents. And that was a bit unfortunate because the ball was kind of dropped. I came in for the um, defenders. A police officer slid down an embankment, grabbed a tree to arrest Paul and yanked his arm in February 2020. It appeared off work with varying minor to moderate symptoms. Returned to work, there were escalating problems, symptoms. He was off work. He returned to full duties. He returned to full duties for a period of time. There was then an arrest of a violent prisoner um, in which he was involved and he injured his arm. And that was in October 2020. And he went off work. He never resumed. Cascade of symptoms, pain, sensory, limb function. The action was initiated in 2021. Disclosure of reports indicated nerve injury entrapment as being the issue from the yanking, breaking the fall, together with an adjustment disorder and depression. Proof was allocated for September 2022. The defenders had seen disclosure of the pursuers' medical reports where um, nerve injury really was what was being talked about. The defenders' agents thought, okay, we're not going to do anything, didn't do anything. Then the um, pursuers in March of 2022 disclosed a neurologist's report, Dr. Richard Davenport. And Dr. Damport was diagnosing FND. Unfortunately, the defender's original agents didn't do anything. Case was passed to new agents in July. The new agents did immediately act on it, but they were facing the upcoming proof in September 2022, just this is July to September. Um, looked around, unfortunately, you were not available. And um, <laughs> um, my name is Dr. Rooney, and um, now I'm with Professor Stoner Carson. Um, we went down south to London, 
um, I think a very distinguished psychiatrist. Um, he agreed with the diagnosis of FND, but then said, I don't really have the expertise to talk about treatment options. Uh, so I can't really tell you what the prospects are for improvement. And I also don't really know what the services are like in Scotland. So I can't really help you. Now, by this stage, we were not far short of the Queen's death. Not that the two are connected, but that was that was a bit of a disruption as well. And we had the proof coming up. And there were so many issues that I would have liked to have explored. I would have liked to have explored, for example, the injury at the time of arrest in October 2020 to see, in fact, if that was a causative or exacerbating. I would have liked to have explored whether there was a predisposition. All these lines of argument that we would have liked to have explored, they might have come to nothing but we didn't have the opportunity. Short point out of this, the moment you see anything to suggest FND, you have got to get in and get the expert advice and also probably vary your timetable. Um, e against F, pursuer fell from height, good recovery from physical injury. Professor Stone for the pursuer and Professor Carson agree on a diagnosis of FND as an explanation for the symptoms of pain, limb tremor and loss of function. Both agree uh, on an approach to treatment and that that should involve a neuropsychologist, but they disagreed on prospects. Um, Professor Stone, potential for improvement, he said, but on balance of probabilities, the symptoms will remain largely the same. Professor Carson, on balance of probability, will return to walking and there's a potential for return to employment. Professor Stone said of Professor Carson, Carson does not make the diagnosis of chronic pain syndrome, which is also present and which I, uh, Dr. Stone, am making. So Dr. Stone was saying that with chronic pain syndrome being distinct from FND and with um, Carson not giving sufficient weight to the presence of chronic pain syndrome, which is an adverse factor when one comes to treat FND, um, on this issue, and with all due respect to my great colleague and friend, Professor Carson, I, Professor Stone, do not have grounds for the optimism that is being shown. So, um, that, the point of that, even with two such distinguished experts, you may have uh, disagreement as to prognosis, and elements of prognosis, uh, or factors with prognosis, will include what other conditions may also be present. So there's an incomplete summary um, of the issues that may arise. Minor injury may result in a constellation of symptoms in absence of a physical injury or disease, may result in multiple medical referrals to multiple disciplines. Uh, there could be a lack of understanding within the medical profession as well. Um, maybe things are changing. I mean, I was drawing that out from the 2009 case, which is now some time ago, and maybe there's greater dissemination of knowledge, but I have, it has seemed to me that um, there may be a lack of understanding amongst at least some involved in medical legal work. Um, the condition has a singular dependency on the accuracy of the patient, yet symptoms may improve under distraction, which is very confusing for the lawyer, um, and vary from day to day, include an element of exaggeration to persuade doctors genuine. Symptoms may seem bizarre. Surveillance evidence may suggest fabrication. Um, detailed and complete review of all available evidence is essential and clinical examination attuned to the specifics of the condition is also essential and you really need the right expert. So moving forward, ex the expert is key in this, effort. that's really what I'm saying. Now, what I'm doing here is that um, I'm about to offer a suggest, well, I'm about to offer, I'm about to share an analytical tool, which to be honest, I use in my own preparation. And it's this. This really applies to all expert evidence. The opinion of an expert is not the important thing for the court. It's the reasoning. And as we all know, what an expert says does not direct, dictate to the court what its own conclusions should be. What you're wanting to do is to hear the whole process that has taken the expert to the opinion and to persuade the court that that is a valid exercise 
which it, the court, should adopt. And this, um, this representation, as it were, of how one builds towards the opinion, um, I find quite a useful tool when I'm preparing the case, when I'm thinking about how to go into a consultation with an expert and to use actually as a continuing method of checking my own strength of case and preparations right through to and in presentation. So just thinking, I mean, it, I hope it's self-explanatory, but just taking a moment or two, I mean, at the base, you're starting with the education of your expert. You know, what discipline do they have? Is it the right discipline? What experience? Do they have enough clinical experience in a particular condition to provide opinions? For example, the psychiatrist and the neurologist lacking the experience of treating patients with FND, for example, that may be a reason why when it then comes to a prognosis, they are in a less good position to give the ultimate opinion. And assumptions are always being made at the start. Um, I think, Cleo, we are going to make available all the slides um, electronically for anybody that, um, that, that, that wants them, because I appreciate no, for anybody wanting to take notes as we go along, that's quite difficult. So then you come also to the next series of building blocks, the information the expert has. So for example, did Professor Carson have the entry from October 2020 of the minor left wrist injury? No, he didn't, then he got it, that changed things. What investigations has the expert carried out? What assumptions are being built in there? And then methodology. Now, Dr. McWhorter was showing us these examples from Dr. Stone examining various patients. The clinical examination, the information gained from the clinical examination is a very important part of the overall opinion process. And those videos were very good at demonstrating some examples of the tests that are carried out in the course of the clinical examination. You want to understand from your expert the methodology that has been brought to bear at each stage of their fact gathering, opinion forming, exercise, the reasons and then the opinion. This talk is titled Practical Points Arising in Conduct of a Litigation. And I'm now really going to focus on consulting with the expert because preparing properly for the consultation throws up all the issues that are live throughout the course of the litigation. Now, you may have chosen to instruct counsel. Congratulations if you've done so. I approve of that. Approve of that. Um, you will have a lot of work on your desk to do, and you may think, right, I'll just pass that to counsel. Nonetheless, it should be a collaborative exercise. And I do suggest that for monitoring whether you have all the evidence you need for the case, monitoring the strength of your case, cross-checking whether your counsel is any use, and going forward to um, your preparations for proof, and potentially ultimately teaching your judge all the issues I'm about to look at arising at the time of consultation continue to be live. So I've got, I think, four slides in this format, consulting. This is all centering around the consultation exercise. And I say compare the pyramid, because where I put in inverted commas, those are things that go back to um, the building blocks of the pyramid. So let's take an example of the CV, where you want a full CV from your expert addressing your FND practice and treatment. And so I've said education and experience, because if I go back to that, it's the education and experience. So that's what I'm trying to do there. So the things to take into account when consulting, um, you want to ensure, and as, as I say, these points um, arise throughout the case, pre-consultation, at consultation, subsequent consultations, prep for proof. Ensure there's a comprehensive evidence base, as Tom was talking about. What do we mean by that? Full medical records. Attendances on that GP or on clinicians before the index event may be very significant for assessing 
whether there was already an ongoing condition, whether there is a new condition, whether there's a predisposition, and may also be very relevant to when it comes to prognosis. So as full medical records as possible, all medical reports from any clinicians who have seen the patient, third party statements, family, friends, colleagues, that issue arose in steel, DWP records, if there be such for application for benefits, surveillance. Throughout the course of your case, have in mind all these adminicals of evidence because they are going to be relevant to your expert assessing whether the account is genuine or not. You want a full CV. So initial instruction of the expert. Um, I digress for a moment. We are very lucky in Scotland to have Professor Stone, Carson, Drs McQuarter and Rooney because they really are absolute leaders in the area. Go down south and try and find equivalents. Not easy, if at all possible, so we're very lucky. We're also very lucky that they understand this role of educating us and ultimately the court. But they may be unduly modest sometimes. And therefore, we don't necessarily always get as full a CV as may be useful to us in understanding their practice. And when I'm talking about that, they, the reasons why they are skilled in diagnosing FND, skilled in treating di uh, FND, and why ultimately they can give um, a, a good opinion on treatment and prognosis. At consultation, establish what evidence has been reviewed by the expert and how they have assessed that, because you want to be sure that evidence you think that you have given them has been seen by them. I'm sure it will be, but just cross check all the time. Um, you want to understand the structure of the clinical examination. You want to understand how it was that the expert conducted the examination. Um, it was a case that I was uh, where Professor Carson was my expert and um, at consultation, it wasn't because I asked a very uh, clever question, but he very helpfully went into how it was that he went about taking uh, clinical history from the patient. Because the way he went about it gave us a better understanding of the responses that had been given so that when surveillance evidence subsequently came in, we were able then actually to say that surveillance evidence isn't the gotcha moment that the defender's think it is. Now, the expert may just, because the expert knows how they go about their business, they may not immediately think this is something we need to know, but it is part of understanding so that at the stage of actually presenting a case in court, for example, you would be able to elicit from Dr. McCarthy how it was that she had gone about taking the evidence. Um, yes, understanding the extent to which the pursuer's account has been tested against the full evidence base. So you want to know when your expert is saying, I have considered the issue of malingering, Yes, there's exaggeration, I accept that, but I do not believe, although it's not for me the expert, it's a matter of the court, but I do not believe as a clinician that this person is deliberately exaggerating the manufacturing symptoms. Why do I say that? Well, the reason I say that is I have gone through the medical records um, and I have seen that there is a consistent pattern of presentation of symptoms or explanation of symptoms sufficiently consistent that I do not see the apparent discrepancies between surveillance evidence and what the pursuer is telling me as significant. Um, if there are inconsistencies or disparities, you want to know from your expert whether they're significant or not. Um, understand the methodology applied by the expert to consideration of both the evidence and the examination. So when they were looking at the third party evidence, what were they looking for in that and how were they then cross checking with the pursuer's account? And the same issue of methodology arises in respect of how the examination was conducted. Um, 
perhaps consider expansion of the report because the expert's not immediately going to come into that consultation thinking, how is this best going to be presented in court? But if the case is going to court, you may very well have to be in a position to educate, well, you're going to be in a position where you have to educate the judge. And so advanced thinking about the judge coming to this is not going to be aware, for example, of these tests and their significance. Not going to be aware of what distraction really means. So perhaps the report, when it is narrating the uh, clinical examination, should give a bit more detail about, I carried out these tests in order to see the extent of which, if distracted, the patient continued to, dis um, to uh, display the symptoms. And the reason I did that was X, Y, and Z. You know, this teaching function, you may well want to think about the expansion of the report for those reasons. And we're not very good about this in litigation. When I was looking at the videos, Professor Stone probably has them in copyright. <laughs> um, when I was looking at the videos, I was just thinking, if you were in court, it might make quite a dramatic impression to be able to show one of these. Now, this is really just thinking off the top of my head because there are issues, maybe copyright issues and so on. But we should be thinking more creatively about such visual aids where they explain something like the distraction test and how when the patient was walking backwards, things were different. We should maybe be thinking about whether we can try and bring that before the court. So maybe something to think about with the um, with the expert. Uh, you want to know from the expert whether malingering has been considered. You want to explore core, uh, sorry, comorbidities, physical disease, psychological, psychiatric issues, and that there may be more than one condition, because that will be of relevance when it then comes to treatment and prospects because comorbidities can make the prospects for successful treatment poorer. Causation, interesting when Dr. McWhorter at the start of her talk said, and I'm glad there is some interest for you in the medical legal work, because <laughs> um, I feel we get all the benefit. Um, we we're also noting that causation is not generally a live issue for you as a clinician, but of course for us it's so fundamental. So, we need to understand when we come to apply legal causation to factual causation, what the factual, what the opinions are as uh, in respect to factual causation are. And issues that may arise there with factual causation, um, was the person exhibiting signs or symptoms before the index event? So go back to the example of Professor Carson getting the updating medical records of the minor injury in October 2020. And he said, yes, you will find other cases where perhaps review of the full medical records will show there's been for a long time a whole series of symptoms. So you want to know about causation there. And also we, the lawyers, are going to want to know, particularly from the defence side, whether there is a predisposition. In other words, but for the index event, might this have gone on to happen in any event? Um, treatment options you need to explore at consultation. Does your expert have an ability in the sense of um, sufficient expertise to, to apply on treatment? And I've had, this, I, I've had this difficulty when neurologists have been my expert and they have said, yes, there's a functional neurological disorder here. In fact, I suspect in general practice, I see more instances of FND than Dr. McWhorter, Alan Carson, because they tend to see it when it gets worse. That's what the neurologists tell me. I don't know if that's true. That's what the neurologists have told me. Um, so I see a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm quite, I'm quite confident about making the um, uh, diagnosis here. And um, Dr. Davenport has said, yes, I'm prepared to go head to head with um, Alan Carson, and he's just down the corridor. Um, when we've then got to the issue of treatment, I've either been told outright, well, actually, I do have to defer. 
for example, because there's a psychiatric component here, and I being a neurologist, that's not my area. Or, well, I do accept actually that uh, Dr. McWhorter has more experience of seeing and treating than I, the neurologist, do have. So that's why you want to explore with your expert the extent to which they feel that they are able to apply the um, treatment and um, prognosis. And so I've given issues there, the neurologist deferring to the psychiatrist as to medication that might be appropriate and thus prospects. Um, geographical location, that was my London psychiatrist. Uh, methodology and reasoning as to treatment in general. Nature of the proposed treatment, you want to explore that. What is being talked about? I mean, for example, should a neurophysiotherapist be involved? Um, clinical um, neuropsychologist, occupational therapist. What is the treatment package? The optimum treatment package that is uh, proposed. And then, of course, you also want to explore availability of treatment. I mean, I get the impression that there are very long waiting lists. Um, and I, I'm imagining that if you have quite a long period that the condition has been established, and then it might be quite a long time before you can access treatment, that that then has, um, that's an adverse factor in assessing prognosis. Um, right. Wrapped up with treatment, I've maybe already covered many of these issues. Prognosis, relevant factors to prognosis, the past medical history. Um, that may be an adverse um, factor in respect to uh, prognosis. The as I understand it, um, the perception of the index event may be an adverse factor when it comes to prognosis. So the more serious the patient considers the event to have been, um, that may be a problem for successful treatment. Um, whether the patient is amenable to treatment, um, as I understand in many cases, uh, the person coming in, no, there must be something wrong with me, something must be broken. It's not in my head. So if that is established, as I understand, that can be an adverse factor in treatment. Comorbidity has been mentioned, mental health overall. And then to what extent is, is statistical evidence of relevance to assessing prognosis for the individual um, patient? Explore with your expert. And then, of course, for us, time and time again, when we're talking about prognosis, what we really want to know is, will there be a return to employment? If so, at what level? So you're wanting, if possible, to get an assessment of what sort of jobs they might be able to do, and you want to cross-reference that to your employment expert. And also it may be relevant for future care provision. So these are all suggestions I have for issues to explore at consultation, but they will be live issues throughout the case. Um, now, I think, yes. So managing the case, this is the third chapter really. Um, Tom has really covered the alert to telltale signs. Um, they include, um, and this is critical to the pursuer's representatives, um, but as there's a scarcity of expert, appropriate experts, defenders need to be, keep this in mind. Um, sorry, issues that arise in the overall managing of the case. You need an expert as early as possible, but one of the problems is the uh, scarcity of experts. Um, another issue arising, the multiple and varying signs present, um, existing medical evidence struggling to find explanation or arriving at multiple diagnoses, inquire of existing experts as to the possibility of functional condition, considering instructing expert in functional disease processes. Managing the case, instruct and confirm appropriate expertise. We've really covered that. The psychiatrist, the neurologist, and the neuropsychiatrist may all um, have the appropriate expertise, education, training, clinical practice, but confirm the extent to which they defer um, on diagnosis of coexisting conditions or on prognosis for treatment understand the CV of the expert, identify what the expert wants. Now, what I mean by that is you should be interacting with your expert to say, right, we've given you all of this information. Is there anything else you want? 
Um, tell us, please. Covered, I think, really by um, Tom when he was talking about pre-litigation. But can I just look at this um, second half? This is in the conduct of the case, interrogating your evidence base. Now, the medical evidence is going to be critical and it needs very careful and complete review. And I suggest that time consuming though it is, you enter into an exercise in tabulating medical evidence. What I mean by that is really going through the pre-index event medical records in respect of attendances, presenting symptoms, any diagnoses made. Now, if you do that tabulating exercise, that will then bear you in good stead throughout the course of the case because it gives you a reference point as to whether there has been any significant change pre and post index. It will be of use to your consultations. It will be of use if you then are going into litigation to have that because it might even be a tabulating exercise that comes to be launched as part of the closing submissions. Now you may say this is council's work and it may be but whether it's being done within the office or whether it's being requested of your council, do give thought to that being done really at as early a stage as possible, because it will continue to be a useful cross check throughout the case. And the reason for that is because, sort in some of the examples of the cases I was involved in, the pre-existing medical records will be a great will be of great significance to the overall diagnosis. Um, other miscellaneous points for managing your case, plead your case. Now the pursuer should plead FND, plead treatment and plead prognosis. And the defender, if there's an evidence base, should plead malingering, exaggeration or fictitious disorder, so as to have a basis to advance a positive line of defense. I know we have abbreviated pleadings, of course, under chapter 43, but do not forget you still need to give notice of uh, any lines you're going to take and a defender in particular may find it uh, difficult to positively advance a line of malingering or exaggeration unless they have something in their pleadings. Again, your counsel should do that, but um, be alert to that as an issue. Managing your case, early consultation, Tom has made the point, it's obvious, but it really is essential. I suggest also early disclosure of expert reports. Now, of course, the practice note requires that we do such a thing, but I think there's a particular practical reason why we want as early disclosure of reports as possible. Because if you have, on either side, pursuer or defender, if you have an expert report that is indicating functional immunological disorder, the other side are going to want to get one of their own. And because there are so few experts, there may be quite a long waiting list. So if you have held on to the report and as a result of that, the other side are able to come to the court and say, we must discharge the proof. We need to get a suitable expert. You may therefore have lost a proof diet that you were wanting to hold on to. So I don't see that there is any tactical advantage in holding on to the report. Disclose it as quickly as possible. Um, surveillance. Well, Pursuers, might want, uh, pursuers agents may wish to advise their uh, clients of that risk. Um, but whichever side you are on, pursuer or defender, um, really as Dr. McQuirter was throwing up um, and also amplified by um, Tom, um, apparent discrepancies between what the pursuer has said and what is seen in the surveillance may not be the gotcha moment that you kind of thought and were hoping for. Um, Another miscellaneous matter, treatment rehabilitation. Do you want, Tom was talking about um, periodic payments. So the evidence is looking as if the pursuer is never going to go back to work and value of the claims very large. Now, um, you go off and get assessment of prospects and the experts come back and say, mm, not sure, yeah, reasonable prospect. Do you want to consider perhaps assisting or punting proof off to quite some distant date in order to initiate the treatment. 
Well, it's a discussion to have with the expert. I think in most cases, Dr. McWhorter has thrown this up, litigation is regarded as an adverse factor in any treatment process. So it may be that the expert will simply say, nobody is going to take on treatment of this person whilst the litigation is ongoing. So you lose the possibility of starting treatment, but I suggest it's something to consider with your expert. Managing the case, late disclosure of evidence. Um, not just surveillance, but any evidence relating to the pursuer's abilities, positive and negative, forward immediately to your expert for commenting. Surveillance evidence must be forwarded for immediate comment. Apparent discrepancies between pursuer's accounts and surveillance do not necessarily mean fabrication, dishonesty, as they may fall within the margin. So when you're sitting at the PTM for the pursuer and the defenders knock on the door and say, oh, we've just got, we've just got some surveillance evidence here. Um, all right. <laughs> that slight sinking feeling in the stomach. Um, Get it off to the expert as soon as possible, because it might not be as bad as you say. But if you get such late disclosure on the eve of the proof, consider objecting to a late allowance of such evidence. That is unlikely to succeed. But also consider moving for discharge to allow proper time to assess with relevant experts and other evidence sources. And if you're making that motion to the court, you want to be in a position, this is really your counsel's obligation, you want to be in a position of just explaining to the court how essential it is that somebody with appropriate expertise comments on this late disclosed evidence and of the uh, lack of availability of suitable experts. Um, so that's sort of, well, it started off with steel, then four cases in which I've been involved just to bring together issues that have confronted me related to FND. I've used the consultation as an example of the issues that you want to explore. And then there's sort of a miscellany of points to take on board. And thank you. Okay, and, and then we have our and ask questions. Uh, <laughs> and then we decide to raise a hand and then pick on just questions. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks very much, Alvin, for your interview. Um, this feels like it's an increasing part of personal injury practice. Um, and I would ask you to, 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 to this is not really my question, but I'm going to speak it in any way for whether you're, whether Dr. Whitworth you're seeing this increasing in clinical practice it, along with legal and whether we went effectively and asked if there's a difference. My real question for you, Dr. Whitworth, is we've already discussed about the, the you know, Asian global conversion disorder, it's functional dis um, neurological disorder, chronic pain syndrome, somatic form, complex regional pain syndrome. How do you distinguish between functional neurological disorder from these other ones? And some experts all, you know, or some people kind of use these as interchangeable. Are they diagnoses that come from a perspective of a particular discipline? And also, which area, in, you know, which, which discipline is best for which? Or is there one that can do them all? That's lots of questions. <laughs> So, first, in terms of, you know, can we say more? So, I haven't been around for that long. Um, I think it's better recognised. Um, it's probably, Edinburgh is probably a typical, so we train people with functional neurological disorder. We get into the ward for, you know, acute exacerbations. That doesn't happen in the block places and get discharged. Um, so, I think it's geographically you have to one, which it happens to be the kind of thing. But um, I think it's been consistent over, you know, like, I think there have been years of history where it looked like it's disappeared, but actually, you call some things. Um, and that brings me to your second question about this overlapping diagnoses. Um, and I suppose some of these are the difficulties, they're not all coming from the same background. So, some functional neurological disorders, but we think of that as 
describing a particular sort of mechanism. And some of them are just non functions which is tough. I mean, it's not the same thing, but if you think of one book, the fact is, you have symptoms of having a book three months ago. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, you know, kind of these symptoms, you know, some of them are just uh, a description of cluster things you see together often. So, um, I, I think if, if you take a step back in different names, uh, these things are, you know, lots of them have common features and you probably have common mechanisms. So, chronic prior decay, infunctional neurological smoothing. They're, they're not completely interchangeable, but they're, they're all common mechanisms. What we decided to go for, um, and I guess clinically, again, don't really have to. <laughs> so you can say this person was probably in functional weakness and um, enjoyed cancer sort of community. Um, I, it probably depends what the, um, what the main symptoms are. So if the main symptoms are um, a loss of function, so a weakness or something, and you can know it's going to be a functional weakness which doesn't include pain. So the main symptom is pain. Should be really good breath and you should be going wrong with pain. And then keep changing it. So, you know, there's a somatic symptom disorder and that if the emphasis there is on the, not so much the symptoms, but the behaviours that go with them. So you can assess the preoccupation, anxiety about symptoms, the non symptoms symptoms are, um, you know, chronic primary pain, you can be more interested in the functional pain and the structure also. It's a nice reading. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very good. It's a very good question because lawyers like one definition of consistency of the use of the definition. Um, and it does not seem to fly in the new world. And so, it is like that in um, a separate condition with the little criteria, you then find that clinicians and so on, and neurologists, and they do the same functions. I mean, people have seen it, but they may not use it in terms in precisely the same way, which introduces an additional one in terms of the future. We're going to put five different expert reports for one opinion. Actually, you come to them as an intelligent, but lay man, lay person, and you're not intelligent when you're told that's a bit of a symptom. The pain specialist is the news information, which is a lot of these stuff, but you know, I might see some of it, but I get it as no pain, and I get it when it's a couple of changing things. So this is the And other articles for both of them, probably, I've linked to, you know, I think there's a really nice thing for about that overlap between CLPS and the time for reconciliation, because they probably are saying, you know, different versions of the same thing. Yeah, any more questions? Yeah, I suppose for us to be large on both sides, one of the problems is that you have two very eminent experts giving very different things to the to hold and you have one massively different valuation of the brain and how we then resolve that and we think to one that performance. And I suppose that's the fear for us that we under settle or overpay due to primary payments. And with that point, I think the prevention of litigation also being an adverse factor. And so for two questions, one John would be who won out of the car center and stolen battle? <laughs> and kind of tied in with that the idea that um to go and further and if the lawyers were sort of saying to you, well we can freeze this action to get some treatment for the the pursuer, and um, is that something that you would recommend, or does the litigation process have to come to an end? Is that very case specific, or do you have an overall view on that? Um, who won the Stone Carson? <laughs> <laughs> as you might expect, it's kind of a bit of a money compromise. Um, Professor Stone, given to me, um, it seemed to me um, some powerful lines of argument. Um, so I took them to Robert Milligan, who was on the other side of the He had a um, uh, nice comparison. And uh, Robert said, well, I don't know what you're saying, but um, this is all the insurance that we're going to talk about. I felt we got a decent enough settlement. It's a non answer to your question, but you're right. It came to me with just a bunch of goods. The lawyers predicted what the court would claim of two such evidence. Experts is the 
And I think the other thing, perhaps, to bear in mind, I don't think either side you are in a position to go to court with a sufficiently detailed understanding of the expert evidence. We need to litigate the issue. You know, you really need, um, you really need to spend an awful lot of time with each of your experts to understand exactly where they were coming from and perhaps uh, um, statistical papers and uh, to be truly on top. So it was a, it was a compliment. They don't cross the pay, he thinks. Oh, well, that's not that's 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 I'm sure this wasn't the case. I didn't really feel either of them wanted to trash the others. <laughs> there would have been a lot of respectful, well, it's quite a well made point. <laughs> so. Um, so, the, the question about whether you would delay the end of the I guess you know, I got the feeling we should do this again and we just get to put it away. But um, I can see the problem that you're in, that you're in it's difficult to assess and um, some of these things you respond to treatment. I think it, it depends on a couple of things. First, is, has somebody had any treatment? So, recently I've seen a few people who have not actually even been given the correct diagnosis. So, you get in the beginning, you've been given the diagnosis of coming in any appropriate treatment. It's really difficult to say how you're going to respond to that. Um, and you hope, or significantly, and you're missing, you hope that it will, um, but, you know, it is difficult. And, you know, somebody needs to tell them what's wrong. They have to have the sun shot or some sort of treatment. Sometimes, even if they've had a fix, you can get a bit of an idea of how you always have gone through it with that. You don't have to accept the diagnosis to a degree, and have someone who's standing on it, otherwise, it's to be. And, uh, yeah, so, and the other thing is, I think, just the specific, in a specific case, how that person is responding to the legal situation. So, some people seem to be asked to. Like sit on a shelf and it's just fun and it's just so okay. It's a different bond with other people. But like really tortured colleagues, you get very involved in the It's very, it's very harmful for these people. It's difficult because it's very unlikely that you're going to respond to treatment. You know, so, so I think it's a bit of a case by case. But yeah. picking up further on the question about the court, are you always going to be a new psychiatrist to give? The best informed opinion on prognosis? Um, no, I don't think so. It depends on the symptoms. Yeah. Um, I think that you're on just our bed, so you could probably be more chronic than we, than we feel that we can. You can still be getting from the You know, it's, uh, some of them, it's heavily individual again, yeah, so some of them is engaged really. Enthusiastically, you could treat the patients with FMD, and some of them would say, I understand FMD, and I'll it, but not really with that. But if there was a coexisting uh, psychiatric, I mean, depression, for example, if there was a clinical depression, mm -hmm. um, are you going to need neuropsychiatrists there because they would be advising the cost of treatment on changes in medication? Yeah, probably a bit of Especially in places where there's some medication. They're not the best medication. Yeah, exactly. They can get a bit of Stuart, Jonathan mentioned about the, the case of a kid at the Bangor section. I think you're able to comment on treatment options as well. I'm aware of a couple of names of anyone who are very well regarded with SND clinicians. But is that something you would see, Doctor, in terms of it being a barrier? Because the reason I ask this, from the language at the time, is I'm not aware of it as well, but how I'm classing it does so in court, regularly give extra reports in English recognition. Mm -hmm. And they are cited by English firms as being the, you know, the leading experts in the UK. And when, would it be a barrier or is it made a plan across the wrong end? You know, the treatment recommendations are based on evidence, and they were saying, you know, it doesn't matter where you are, what the treatment recommendations are. I guess the, the availability of treatments recommendation, but like, 
I don't know if that's something that you should be limiting our recommendations to what's what's very really good. Okay. See, I haven't. That's not something I've thought of before. You know, what that recommendation we should have seen to the neuropsychologist. I don't think we'll have any of them. We do that. Is it available kind of thing, or is it, is it the but, case? Yeah, so, yeah, so it's available privately. Um, yeah. I've heard it suggested that you're not benefiting at all from it, not accepting the skill set at all in the name of chairs. I mean, as a litigator, I, I mean, you can make a claim against the chairs, can't make it cost the private yeah. thing, but is that actually... So, the, um, so it's improved the availability, sort of quality, of it. It's a improving, it's a brilliant social and certainly quality of the not a And and by the way, it is improving. There are more things that you take from this case to the end. I would say it does have to be something that's good to experience because um, physio, especially, so the physio for, you know, my fact is different because of breath there are, and again, I've went to the resources, there's a really good consensus recommendations for video or patient therapy, speech and language therapy, that are quite kind of practical hands on advice that actually an interested specialist in the interest in physical world to so read that and take it on board and do some good treatments. Um, so it's partly finding someone that's, that's interested and enthusiastic. The problem is you have to send them to physio and say, oh, because they couldn't possibly treat you, you're too sore. <laughs> I'm just uh, intrigued by the effectiveness of the distraction techniques when we observe them in the, in the videos. And I wondered if that's well understood. And if it, if it is, are there any uh, treatments which are being developed of uh, the future to use those? Uh, yeah. So, again, as soon as you start on distracting people, and then, you know, to get their automatic movement back in fact, then the hope is that you can generalise and uh, get their automatic movement back around in what in fact we do things. Um, the the physio, yeah, so the physio is very used by specialists. Um, it's just been a, a big trial and how many people have gone these things on tension so about doing very intense physio, so twice a week over the FNZ. Um, I don't expect to be but the physio is very much an sort of distraction, but it's really learning the moment and you think that is that a new is it understood why it's effective? So I think again, it's because that's the what the sort of hypothetical mechanism is that there's a problem with your attention, your attentional focus. So you start focusing on something like it's a bit like you say like say you say the same word again and again and again. It starts to feel weird, it starts to sound weird, it sound weird, um, and you just need to stop playing that word. But uh, yeah, I think, I think there's something that happens, and some people are obviously particularly vulnerable to it for what's in the reason that when I mean, they get this abnormal potential for things. And then, of course, it's a vicious cycle for saying that it's something to have you all in Also, very hard on you It's increasingly serious. I think it's not to be attempting in that constitution to pursue our day. <laughs> I, I must admit, I, from a personal experience, when I was looking at it, I was fascinated by the concept of spontaneous remission. I thought it was powerful one. But I wanted to ask, is how common is it in the so, My project is not common. I think it's a bit, yeah. So I think it depends as well. So, I mean, very acute onset functional symptoms do be spot in So, if, you know, quite commonly people would present with suspected stroke. If you worked up the stroke, don't want to find out what you are, it wasn't stroke, they get that sediment, you know, 24 hours. Uh, and that's, you know, like what's going to keep it and it can present like that. So, I think for your short case, if people who've been on an for a long time and something like that, it certainly happens. Um, I mean, certainly recovery from that case, it doesn't always happen. It's not, it, it doesn't behave like a you know, normal disease. 
your property is a pathological way of dealing with disease. It's not always a piece of your life. So sometimes people can get a bit better and maybe some may get better. And the meaning is some videos of us doing um, 36 situations. So people are completely paralyzed, so they are all the way. And you don't really aesthetically you give them a bit comfortable, so just a sort of light aesthetic, but not enough that they're asleep. You video them and examine them and you can get them to reduce the cost of the condition, you get their arm moving properly. And sometimes they, they you know, afterwards, you still need to video them when you can't really appear. So, anyway, you know, you use it to be like, what's the cost of it? You can do something to get spontaneous remission in response to something that's evil, but that tends to be sort of what you get once again. And it's been touched on some of the things that we have. Exactly, I think it's the only way has been to pass away. I kind of perhaps a video of the place of death and death during the course of litigation, but being reluctant to accept that, that would be such a huge way of treatment. And just remain in place, you know, going into early symptoms, and you should get that in the place of detention. I do not think that any of that has been to know. Very domestic loss. Actually, I mean, so. It's general. So, yes, I mean, the issue, of, the issue of the lawyer would be um, okay, so the consumer does not believe that anything wrong with the subject object. Um, I still want someone to tell me that it's a damaged neuro, for example. Um, and that is the significant barrier to treatment or at least significant barrier to treatment. So the defendants come along and say, well, there's a failure to mitigate loss here. Um, the argument must be stateable, but I suppose it would come back to the facts. You would be saying to the expert, I think perhaps, okay, so Tom has said, no, it's not in my head. There's, there's a damaged mineral. I just therefore am not doing that in this treatment. I suppose maybe you'll come to the experts and say, from Tom's perspective, is that a reasonable position to adopt? What might be done to get around this? It's a slightly awkward position when you see someone for you're, uh, you're not in a treating clinician. So it's not my job to give them the diagnosis. Um, and it's not really appropriate all those things to give them the diagnosis and explain it to them because that's the start of treatment, actually. I mean, that's not what we deal with. So I find that's an awkward activist Um And then you know, you could, I, I would broach it and say, you know, it's a big what you may be bad at. But I, I don't think it's enough for the only choosing the big question in the people's books. You know, you can't say it. Um, I, and I was thinking one of the case where you can get a few cases I've recommended. In one case, it makes happy that they got, like, they were seen seen by a neurologist for a couple of sessions to kind of go through the time, which is probably made up, which is pretty good. Not for and if we don't think that you're going to say that you're just treating so giving them a sense of credit to give them a credit. And that does take some of the crew transactions, especially if it's new information. If you tell them something that wasn't expected, they're overwhelmed, you know, because they're just thinking for the two hours. <laughs> so, so, you know, we can need a bit of time and think about it. And, and certain work is with that has been helpful for the museum, you know, they really come around with a lot better understanding. So I think, yeah, I think it's not enough to just have that. And, and the other thing is that sometimes people are not on the diagnosis until actually they've embarked on treatment, physio, you know, TV series, and then you actually know what I think these seniors have been seen that way, what's happening. So, so I think you know, we've had a long way down the path before you say, especially when they're getting to treatment. I think. I suggest leaving the answer. I mean, if, if the expert is saying, um, I think there is treatment that can be offered, although their present attitude is an adverse factor, and so the prognosis is a bit iffy, iffy. I suggest from a legal point of view that pursuer, um, the starting point is that pursuer um, will be assessed on the basis that they do need to go to the treatment, but because of their attitude, the prognosis yeah, be not great. But I think that the court would approach it as well if the clinician, if the experts are saying treatment, there is, there is a treatment plan for them. I think the court would approach it as, right, we're going to start from the point of view that there is treatment right there, although I never take any of the parents, 
that the students' attitude is such that their prospects are sometimes in the air. Although there are some in the orthopedic context, there will be some. Some pastors who say, so you tell me there's an operation, you're not considering the operation, you're not going to be able to do it. And then, of course, just has to, has to follow its reasoning. And that could be all sorts of factors like the success rate. I mean, if the operator, if the orthopedic surgeon is saying, oh, we can use um, procedure rates is available, and it has a 100% success rate, then the medication will not be close like that. Whereas if the orthopedic surgeon is still in the surgery, then 400% Take with you to choose me to work. So, but I think in the example you're talking about in court, in assessing whether um, treatment is going to achieve a significant improvement, it will make the assumption that the pursuer has to go forward to treatment. But it will take on board the fact that their attitude may be something that makes success less than I suggest. So there is a lot of stigma that's actually going into this. And sometimes when you listen to these stories about what's happening to the director, you think they're going to be 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 going to that, uh, that that may be part of the stigma issue because they're wanting validation that the act is very serious and has been damaged. Yeah, a little bit further, that's not validation, but we're just making it less serious. Right. Possibly. Okay. Yeah. 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 Nice to be strong, that. And is it, is it correct to say that more women than men suffer from it than they do? And it's still the gene of one that is. So, yeah, about two or three stories in the world are going to be And there, there are lots of possible reasons. I mean, so, so there's probably some biology to it. Um, women have different pain responses, different sorts of pain responses. Whereas, you know, there's, there's probably something there. Um, women present more, so it might be that they may be completed in the room to be like Wendy, or who knows, more advanced stuff happens to me as well. Uh, and then have a lot of women who have certain responsibilities in the world that, you know, there are just a lot of bad things in the world. I'm getting a few questions about it. <laughs> Almost good to know. And so, and the next possibility you want to know is both from a lot of object of reason or by the group, and then the question about the bar of the thing. And she talked about the sort of the company process and then she talked about the, the company process and future prospects of suffering from head injuries. It was just this year. At what point was someone that's receiving like, treatment? At what point did you say this bill then assessed it because they effectively had a ceiling for recovery? Yeah, so I mean, that's always difficult when litigation is not going because we want them to do it better once that is finished. And I think if somebody's because the duration of symptoms can be important. Sometimes that's taken for a long time. We've got a lot of secondary problems because of that. So you know, lost your job and everything you know, all life is now. You know, you know, the cost of what's so you know, um, I think having trials using the treatments. So of course, it's easy to you. Of course, it's dependent on the patient what the recommendation would be. Um, and the treated comorbidities. Best you can, so depression, PTSD. And then you've got a bad stuff up for the way, so some of this, uh, depending on increase in favor, and you know, all that sort of stuff. But you could say, yeah, just a little bit But the problem is that it takes such a long time to go through all of them. 
I think it would depend on the nature of the substance issue um, and the impact rates, not on their, on their lifestyle and you know, how much disability that's been situated to. So, you know, as with alcohol, one thing, alcohol, if you're properly, properly alcohol dependent, you get away with it for so long before you start to have complications which are quite good to hospital and disability problems. Um, you know, some people smoke cannabis for their whole lives, you can seem to do do too much damage. Uh, uh, you know, I think it depends fair to its substitutions. Um, you know, on opiates or these things to you know suggest taking them for the long. Yeah, I think it very much depends on the pain. Either substance, like nature of the substitution, substance disorders. So, it's not the most common, so it's intended to get the use of cannabis in this case for the pain. And then I see patients who developed alcohol problems, so to be said, to be pain and disabled. But other things, yes, absolutely. And I've learned on that, and so the evidential work and fact, if you say that some history of substance abuse groups. They have a important thing for us and that can be paid as So, the next question. Um, because you're talking about finding, you're talking about findings and facts, ultimately, probably the need. And so, well, your example would be the history of substance misuse in your job. Um, we are therefore saying that, um, well, <clears throat> let's say that this is a history of substance misuse. Let's say the expert evidence is that that is an adverse factor for the success in treatment. That, I think, is taken to pursue it as we find it. So, in that example, that is the issue substance abuse, adverse factor to success in treatment. I think it's taken to serve as a and therefore, actually, it doesn't even be on the If, on the other hand, there is treatment available for the substance abuse, which is on the evidence of the expert that it treats in the person who they are on, and they're just confusing so to do, that might be an indication of loss of the which therefore might have an effect on the quantity of is that the sort of thing you have in mind? Yeah, um, no, I, I, I bluntly agree with that overall. Um, I suppose your um, secondary uh, factor, uh, again, not to speak as on the judiciary at all, but obviously, uh, but there's read some people, um, any kind of evidence of that nature is often one that you have to factor into whether it's going to engage sympathy or otherwise from them. It's, it's a blunt, blunt, it's a reality of what to be aware of. Um, I'm not saying that it will necessarily play a role, but I think to be practical about it, it's just something to the day in the mind is an additional consideration. I'm, I'm right in saying that, um, let's just say, child abuse might be um, a predisposing factor. It's a risk factor. A risk factor. And with child abuse cases, what was often the NC development deal with alcohol dependency or other things. So I think the court would be quite sympathetic in those circumstances. Um, and although you're right, um, the courts may find it unattractive sometimes if there's evidence of substance abuse. At the same time, the courts will, in the right circumstances, award as part of the damages, the money that has been spent on alcohol that has just been... Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And then, so follow on the market, um, we do then say that um, does that need to demonstrate that that previous lifestyle would be an insulted and an MMP? Well, without getting into the grounds of the causation, um, and I think that probably have to defer to the expert in terms of whether the FMP has been uh, caused, is it worth finding, like a substance abuse? Is it a risk of the 
particularly this factor, it's more that they there's they have shared risk factors of the life of diversity. Um, you know, there was, you know, there, there was perhaps some quite better and for ourselves and us. So, please, um, and then just try to find one last You may find the room is charging new fact. And just like a, a couple of shows, you can be a tricky thing from getting the symptoms. To a traumatic incident or accident that's happened to the doctor, and well, those who can sort of know there's a head injury, and there's not a direct head injury. A sign is not the thing of a neurologist. Is there any additional evidence that would be helpful to then attribute that head injury to that accident? You don't have to leave your head to get into these. Okay, thank you everyone for coming to the inaugural conference. Um, I believe all was planning to go to the so that we can feel anyone else is keen to join us. Uh, depending on the group size, I will buy the first round. <laughs> I leave myself too bad without being super size. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we are rather apologetic. We had planned to have groups available here, but we said we no such an error. In other words, we didn't book that earlier, and we're sorry about that. We don't realize that there's a cut off point for it. Uh, nonetheless, I'll be going around the corner to the advocates if anyone wants to join in, as I say, I'll be Thank you all very much.